My name is Jim Wilburn, and I'm the Dean of the School of Public Policy at uh, Pepperdine University. And I'm glad to welcome all of you here this morning for this discussion on the broadband technology explosion and how we can rethink the, the communications policy for a, a mobile broadband uh, world. It's no secret even to the uninitiated that um, consumers are opting to do more and more uh, with their, their mobile devices, whether handheld cell phones or tablets, smartphones um, uh, powered by mobile broadband that has uh, therefore revolutionized uh, our lives and our work and our play. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning is introduce in a moment uh, four outstanding people to talk about the, the possibilities of, and, and the challenges of, uh, of, of policies that relate to this. In 2000, 4.4 percent of American households had uh, home connection to broadband. Uh, in 2010, this had jumped to 68 percent. And these are, not alar these are not new to most of you, but I think they do set the stage for what a dramatic shift we have witnessed in, in a very brief period of time. Today, 94 percent of U.S. homes can access wireless and wired broadband networks at a baseline speed um, that's greater than 10 megabytes per second, which is quite incredible uh, compared to where we were just, just a very few years ago. Just the past three years, the average delivered broadband speeds have doubled, uh, nearly twice the speed enjoyed today even in Western Europe, and, uh, and uh, more than five times the global average. With advanced mobile broadband um, service, the U.S. clearly leads the world in many ways in next generation high speed mobile broadband instructions and um, build out and services. What I'd like to do this morning is to um, introduce our speakers, one of whom is from Pepperdine, and um, several people already this morning have told me that they were first interested in this when they thought it might be in Malibu. Um, I tell people that most universities try to live up to their brochures, and we try to live up to our location. Um, actually, I feel uh, very much at home in this area because in a previous lifetime at Pepperdine, I was a vice president, I'd been provost, I'd owned my own company for 10 years before I got involved in the academic world. And um, I intended to leave Pepperdine and do that, but I decided to go through our presidential key executive MBA program myself. I had a PhD in economic history, but I felt like I needed an MBA. So I went, went through our program, and in those days, we offered that program up here in the Bay Area. Um, we would start three, three groups a year, two in Southern California and one up here uh, in the Bay Area. So I signed up for the one in the Bay Area. And so once a month for uh, two years, I spent all day Friday and all day Saturday here, and all of my classmates were uh, people who either worked for venture capital people or people who were after venture capital. And so um, it's great to be back in, in, in the Bay Area. We also have a very close relationship up here through the School of Public Policy to Hoover. Um, our former president of Pepperdine, who founded the School of Public Policy, is um, a counselor. He's a senior fellow at Hoover Institute. And, and um, consequently, uh, Jim, I think we have about six or eight of our graduates are either fellows or senior staff at the Hoover Institute. So seeing the, uh, the Hoover uh, uh, Tower as I drove down Sand Hill reminded me that we've got, that we've got a lot of people up here. So we're here to, today because like you um, uh, and those of us here at, at Pepperdine, this booming sector of our economy uh, is a very important one. We're going to discuss today questions like what are the technical and economic challenges to wireless broadband deployment? What kind of benefits, both economic and societal, can wireless broadband bring to uh, rural populations or to other underserved populations? 
Uh, what sort of benefit can wireless broadband bring to areas like health care or education or energy? Uh, how can we fashion policies that best incentivize private investment that will support the massive capital expenditures that are necessary to support the new broadband uh, technologies? Uh, how can we free up more spectrum? Uh, how do we drive wider adoption and use of the infrastructure among consumers? And similar, similar questions. The individuals who will be speaking this morning, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll speak, uh, include Larry Downs, who's the author of Big Bang Disruption, uh, published by Harvard Business Review, and the author of a forthcoming book uh, on the subject of disruptive innovation. Following him is Jim Prieger. Professor Prieger is uh, an associate professor of economics in the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine, uh, has authored uh, several papers on broadband economics and policy. One of the agreements that he and I had when we hired him, when we uh, lured him to Pepperdine, was that he would uh, be permitted to leave for a year fairly shortly thereafter to spend a year at the FCC. So he has a perspective not only from the academic world, but uh, from the seat of all knowledge in Washington, D.C. Richard Clark, the author of um, <clears throat> Expanding Mobile Wireless Capacity, The Challenges Presented by Technology and Economics, um, which is a, a white paper um, published by SSRN. And um, then following him, uh, Hal Singer, co-author of The Need for Speed, a new framework for telecommunications policy in the 21st century, uh, which is an eBay an e book published. So at this time, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Downs. Well, thank you very much, Dean Wilburn, and uh, welcome to all of you. We're very excited to talk to you today about broadband and particularly how we think uh, policy can, in fact, accelerate the deployment of broadband and obviously its many uses. Uh, I'm going first because I'm going to talk about some uh, research I've been involved with for the last couple of years, working on a project looking at the changing nature of disruptive innovation uh, in a new kind of disruption that we uh, refer to in our article as Big Bang Disruption. Uh, and I think it'll become clear as I go through why we're sort of starting with this. We think it has, uh, I think it has some pretty significant policy implications, the, the sort of way in which new technologies are entering the market, and uh, not just in technology industries, although that's certainly where it's first, but in every industry, everything from public utilities, energy, education, manufacturing, and financial services and healthcare, uh, we're starting to see a similar kind of pattern. And, uh, and we'll talk, and I'll talk at the end here, particularly about how I think this involves uh, communications policy uh, on some of the most important things what we're, we're going to focus on, including uh, mobile technology spectrum, uh, as well as, uh, as the, uh, the retirement of the uh, legacy switched uh, telephone system. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start with an odd example of the uh, phenomenon that we have observed, uh, which sort of, you know, is close to my heart because I'm a kid at heart and uh, I'm a long-standing fan of, of pinball machines. Um, those of you who are sort of old enough to remember uh, pinball machines, they used to have these big giant boxes and they would be in these things called arcades uh, and you would put quarters into them and play them for about, you know, two to three minutes depending on how good you were and then put another quarter into them. Uh, and this is very old, it was, you know, what goes back to the 1930s, even older for sort of non-electrical versions of it. But uh, it has had a very long history as an industry and some very interesting things along the way. It was banned uh, in the, you know, sort of as the, in the 50s and 60s as kind of the same uh, phenomenon that was you know, outlawing comic books and other things that were thought to contribute to juvenile delinquency. Uh, pinball started to come back. Uh, the bans were lifted in the 60s and the 70s in particular. Electronics now were able to uh, make them much more interesting machines and, and uh, uh, there was a big uh, boom in them. Uh, and even as the sort of early days of uh, video games, uh, arcade video games came in, things like uh, you know, Pac-Man and, and Space Invaders and so on, actually uh, helped the pinball industry because it created new places. These, these arcades got bigger and more plentiful, and that sort of you know, gave more opportunities for them to reach a market. So even in the early days of, of, uh, of arcade games, in fact, pinball thrived. 
uh, and looked like you know things were as good as they got in 1993, which is sort of the peak of uh, of the pinball industry. Uh, they had uh, sort of 130,000 new tables sold. And these are pretty expensive devices, so that was a, a pretty significant number. Uh, several manufacturers uh, still working at that point, maybe half a dozen major of them, most of them centered in Chicago, uh, perhaps for, for obvious reasons if you know the, the, the uh, institutional history of gambling and arcade machines. Uh, and then suddenly, the very year after the uh, giant leap, the, the, the sort of best year ever for pinball was followed by the worst year ever for pinball, and in fact, a decline over the next couple of years that took it down to numbers that had, had not, simply had never existed in the history of the industry. In fact, a decline that it never recovered from. Uh, all the manufacturers uh, sort of consolidated and closed. There's sort of one left, uh, and still to this day, there is one left, mostly serving a, a kind of nostalgia market, people buying new machines, but for home uh, use, as sort of people like me who, uh, who, who missed the good old days. Uh, and so you had this sort of strange phenomenon of an industry that was going up, 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 and then suddenly uh, collapsing for all time. Uh, and it turned out what had killed them wasn't uh, competition from the sort of arcade games. What had killed them was the introduction of a, a new technology that probably wasn't even thought of or in, certainly not intended by its uh, creators to be a competitor to arcade pinball machines, and that was the uh, introduction of the Sony PlayStation. Uh, there had been home video game consoles uh, for many years before that, but the PlayStation really was the first machine that finally kind of cracked the, cracked the nut of what it would take to get widespread adoption of uh, home gaming consoles now in the millions of units. The price was right, the performance was right, uh, the quality was right, and uh, the PlayStation, as many of you know, took off. It was sort of million, you know, on the one side here, we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of units. On this side, we have millions of units. And with the rise of uh, the PlayStation in a very sudden and dramatic way over a couple of years, most of the arcades uh, closed down, took the arcade video games with them as well as pinball, and then pinball never recovered. So we refer to that phenomenon of kind of a new technology that in some ways is, is better uh, and, and cheaper uh, and more kind of customized to the, uh, to the user. Uh, suddenly entering a market and in the process disrupting or even in this case devastating a, a related market, maybe even a, a distantly related market without any particular warning, you know, without any sort of sign uh, of a need for a strategic response. We refer to that as a kind of a big bang disruption because, you know, like a, the big bang uh, theory of the universe, when it happens, it's all over and, uh, and there's nothing really much you can do. And from a business standpoint, I won't dwell on this very long because I want to get to the policy stuff, but um, there's some very interesting implications to this, uh, to this idea. The more we see these big bang disruptions, the more we realize that much of the conventional wisdom of how business strategy, business planning, kind of competitive analysis, uh, the whole field of strategic planning, which is kind of in an uproar for a lot of reasons, uh, much of the conventional wisdom just doesn't apply anymore. Uh, and we'll talk about what's driving that and why we see it happening in all industries, not just, as I say here, in, in consumer electronics. But if you sort of know anything about the kind of traditional views of strategic planning, one of the absolute rock-solid foundational principles of strategic planning is that uh, if you want to launch a strategy, you have to focus on one of what's called uh, three strategic disciplines. Right? You either have to focus on being the low-cost provider, you have to differentiate your product so you can offer it at a premium price, or you have to offer something that's very customer intimate that, uh, that sort of you know, traps users in a way that they can't easily uh, substitute for, for something else, whether it's better or cheaper. Well, as I said in my example, the Big Bang disruption, it's all three at once, often unintentionally. They're better, they're cheaper, and they're more intimate. Uh, I, I agree, a great example of this, we just came across last week, there's a, uh, a chain of, uh, of coffee shops in Taiwan called uh, Let's, Lot, uh, Let's Cafe, and they are actually inside convenience stores, so they're not you know, particularly uh, appealing places relative to sort of standalone coffee shops. Um, and so what they've done now is they've taken advantage of new, uh, again, better, faster, and cheaper uh, 3D printing technologies. And what happens is you walk now into one of these cafes, you take a photo of yourself with your mobile device, uh, you send it to them, you sort of you know, SMS it to them, and then they have 3D printers that will print in milk powder a picture of you, a very high resolution picture of you uh, in sort of milk powder on top of your latte. Um, and this is, you know, raised sales tremendously. It's, it's been a, it's sort of a huge success for them. 
And essentially what they're doing is they're competing on all three of these disciplines at once. It's, it's, it's cheaper, it's, uh, it's better, uh, and it's more intimate than what you could get just walking into a, into a chain coffee store. Marketing is also affected. The way in which you innovate is affected. But I you know, want to just sort of focus on this fact that, that we have this sort of better, cheaper, more intimate phenomenon uh, first and foremost. The other thing that's very important to note, and I think this, is, this has a tremendous policy implications as well, is the way in which markets are now adapting, or adopting, I should say, these kinds of disruptors is very different. We have the traditional, a little hard to see from the color, but the traditional bell curve model of technology adoption. You have early markets, you have mainstream markets, and then you have what's called the laggards. And this is a work that was done many, many years ago by Everett Rogers and then picked up by, by Jeffrey Moore in his book, Crossing the Chasm, talking about the marketing of this uh, this kind of uh, adoption curve. Well, what we find in, in Big Bang disruption is that when this sort of right combination of things comes together, so you've got the PlayStation that comes together, you've got the, the 3D printed coffee comes together, the market responds immediately and all at once. So every segment of the market immediately uh, moves to the better, cheaper, more intimate offering, abandoning on the one hand the older products and then uh, you know, causing great uh, upsurge for, for the new product. So when people you know, went to the PlayStation, it wasn't people you know, early adopters. No, there's no more early adopters. It's sort of everybody at once. Uh, that also means that, what, that the saturation happens much more quickly. So you know, at a certain point, everybody's got a PlayStation. Uh, and so therefore, at some point, the sales will start to drop off, again, at a much more dramatic pace. And companies who are offering these products need to plan very differently uh, for them, but people who are going to be disrupted by these products also need to understand this, uh, this much reduced, much crunched uh, time frame. Well, what's driving this, obviously, is, is the, the whole point of this discussion, and that's, you know, essentially we're, we're sort of sitting here in Sand Hill Road, so we're kind of at ground zero for really what's behind this level of disruption and why, as I say, we think it, it moves out of technology industries to all industries. Uh, and that is essentially the deflationary uh, experience of technology. All the sort of core drivers of technology pricing, whether it's for, for uh, you know, semiconductors, displays, uh, storage, memory, uh, transmission costs, all of them of, uh, for many years now, in fact, in the case of uh, Moore's Law since you know, the mid-1960s at least, have been following this path of better, cheaper, faster, and smaller uh, for many, many years, in fact, for many, many decades. And as more and more products and services uh, become reliant on technology as the driver of value, as the driver of price, that deflationary principle is what's leading to this cap capability for new interrupters to enter into the market with a faster, better, and cheaper offering at the same time. The more, the, more essentially, the more computing technology is involved in the product or service, the easier it is to enter into the market as a big bang disruptor. Uh, and one of the key inflections that we noticed is it's not just the cost of embedding technology, it's also the cost of innovating itself. So the cost of research and development, again, in, even in fields like uh, genomic research or nanotechnology uh, and, uh, and sort of, you know, uh, healthcare related fields, much of the research and development, which is often very expensive and lots of sort of long lead time, a lot of that research is also getting cheaper, relatively speaking, because of the use of computers, because of the availability of better computing. So not only are we putting computers into stuff and the computers we're putting in are getting cheaper, but using those computers in the development of those products is also getting cheaper. And at a certain point, what we say here is that uh, essentially, you know, if you, you've got cheaper technology but more expensive research, then you're going to enter the market kind of more expensive but better. But if your research prices go down and your embedded technology goes down, at a certain point, you're going to be able to do both better and cheaper on a new market introduction. And, and we have sort of some weird phenomena. This is my last uh, discussion about the, the gaming industry. But uh, we see, as I say, that, that rapid adoption, rapid saturation, and then rapid abandonment uh, happens uh, very, very frequently. So this is just a chart showing uh, one, two, three, four, and then the beginning of a fifth generation just of game consoles from Nintendo. All of them have this phenomenon, a very short spiked adoption, rapid saturation, and then rapid abandonment. And what's interesting really about this chart is, you know, some did better than others. Obviously, the, the Wii, which is the biggest uh, chart here, that was the most successful introduction, but it had that remarkable up and down uh, phenomenon. But what you might notice about this chart is that the next generation product 
uh, does not actually come into the market until a year or two after the uh, abandonment, after, or sort of after sales start to decline. And what this means, what we think this means is that, the, again, because of the information uh, network, because of the, the way in which information now goes not just from kind of experts and, and people who are really fanatics, but to the entire market, is that the market knows way before the manufacturer does when it's time for the next generation product. And they will signal that by stopping their purchase. So this happens with smartphones, this happens with laptops and tablets and computers, it happens with game consoles, it happens with most forms of consumer electronics, is that the market will stop. They will say it's time for the next iPhone, whether, whether Apple's ready to launch it or not. Uh, and we refer to this phenomenon as near perfect market information. There's very little now inefficiency, little transaction cost in every consumer being able to find out whether it's through Twitter or Facebook or for th sort of you know, user forums or other websites. We all know what the manufacturers are working on. We all know what the technology is capable of. And we will stop buying when we think it's time for something that's going to be better and cheaper and more intimate. So this puts tremendous pressure even on people who have successfully launched Big Bang Disruptions. The pressure never lets up to develop and launch the next one, preferably even faster and, and, uh, and more dramatically than the previous one. Uh, what this means for incumbents is something that uh, you know, can be extremely devastating, as, as we say in the article. Uh, this is sort of a chart that shows what happened to the standalone uh, GPS navigation market when, in fact, even before there were smartphone-based uh, navigation apps, just with the introduction of the iPhone and the sort of and Android and the realization that a smartphone market was finally going to take off and that uh, there would be the opportunity for apps on those smartphones that might compete, immediately with the introduction of these devices, the standalone, uh, smartphone, uh, standalone GPS market started to decline rapidly. Uh, and of course then with the introduction of things uh, like the, the Apple product and then the Google navigation product which were again, they were better, they were cheaper and they were more intimate than the standalone devices uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, they were cheaper because they were free for one thing. Uh, the actual market for standalone GPS devices has simply collapsed. Uh, to the extent these companies are still in business, it's selling uh, their in-dash nav in navigation tools and more specialized tools, but the standalone market is essentially dead and it happened in the course of a couple of years. Um, let me just skip that because I want to get on to, uh, I want to talk about this uh, from two standpoints, from the standpoint of the communications industry. Uh, one, in w one is the way in which the communication industry itself is a uh, sort of uh, what I think of as an arms merchant for Big Bang disruption. So obviously, as I said, one of the main deflating technology drivers that's pushing Big Bang disruption into more industries is the fact that communications costs and the availability of, of uh, high-speed communication continue to follow this trend of, of Moore's laws that are better, cheaper, faster, smaller, uh, almost on a, on a predictable basis. So much of what's driving Big Bang disruption is coming from the communications industry. And what we've seen now in the last few years is the emergence of what you might think of as a ecosystem. Now it's not really sort of, again, in traditional business language we talk about supply chains. Well, the, the, the supply chain is kind of a, an old-fashioned terminology. It implies kind of unidirectional movement from manufacturer to distribution through retailing and to, uh, finally to a dead end at the consumer. That's not the way big bang markets work and certainly not the way the communications industry works. It's really more of an ecosystem where, in fact, uh, you have competitive uh, pressure being put on the manufacturers of devices by consumers. You have pressure being put on the carriers by the app developers. It's sort of, it's a kind of everybody affects everybody else and everybody in some ways uh, uh, drives everybody else to continue to develop these kinds of applications that are better and cheaper and, and more intimate. So we have a lot of very important components here to the broadband ecosystem that are a big part of what's driving uh, this, uh, this phenomenon, again, in, in all sorts of industries outside of the industry itself. But obviously we, we have, you know, the sort of fixed uh, high-speed broadband, we have mobile broadband, we have the devices themselves, we have this phenomenal uh, uh, new ecosystem of app developers and app stores, uh, you know, kind of this new kind of cottage industry way of developing, again, using a lot of off-the-shelf components and reusable software, reusable interfaces and reusable protocols, we can get millions, literally billions of apps uh, being delivered. They never have to be, of course, manufactured or packaged. They all just come down uh, through the network. 
we have the uh, convergence of many, many different networks, not just the telephone network, but also the broadcasting network, uh, radio, all these things, all these once very separate networks that were treated very separately have become all standardized now increasingly on one protocol, which is Internet Protocol, the IP protocol, and so voice is now over VoIP, and television, of course, goes increasingly uh, through IP or related technologies, either through the Internet or through the cable providers or through um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, telephone companies who are offering uh, uh, television service as well. Uh, the deployment of fiber, that of course is big, the, the, the move to LTE and ultimately to, to next generation uh, high speed uh, mobile uh, protocols like 5G, the global internet itself, the standards for, for, uh, for all these things, and then finally the kind of contribution, con content distribution platforms and protocols, things like YouTube, uh, things like the App Store, things like uh, iTunes and, and the Android ecosystem as well. But on the other hand, uh, the sort of the arms merchants, if you will, to that world are also themselves being uh, uh, victimized by a couple of key disruptions, a couple of big bang disruptions that are happening in the broadband world, particularly to the providers of the communication services. Uh, one of those, as I mentioned, is this transition to native IP technology. So particularly for wireline telephone providers, uh, the old switch telephone network, which you know ran beautifully for a hundred years, give or take, uh, is really increasingly obsolete. Uh, it's not as it, you know, it's, it's not as fast, it's not as cheap, it's not as intimate as uh, IP bundled uh, solutions that have you know more intelligence in the network architecture itself. And there's really almost no one left in the world who would argue that there's any real competition left anymore here. It's clear that the old switch telephone network is uh, obsolete. Uh, the carriers are moving as quickly as they can now to native IP technologies, whether it's through uh, fiber or copper fiber uh, combinations, and then getting the old switch uh, services onto IP sort of switches and native protocols. Uh, but obviously, you know, the consumers are, are sort of voting with their feet. The number, I think now, according to the, uh, the CDC, of homes without any, you know, have essentially cut the cord completely. We have no fixed uh, uh, telephone service from the, from the copper network is up to over 50, somewhere near 60 percent. Uh, and and uh, this is a transition that we'll I'll come back to because there's a major policy implication here for how we encourage that. I mean, we, obviously, we want people to go to a better, faster, cheaper, uh, and more intimate uh, uh, technology when we can. There's no reason not to. So really, the question here is how do we accelerate that transition uh, and what policy levers have we got to do that? And then secondly, as the dean mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, spectrum. So the, 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 one of the problems is sort of we're victims of our own success. One of the key limiters here, uh, if you're making silicon chips, if you're making semiconductors, you know, kind of your main input here is sand. That, that's, you know, not a problem. We have as much of that as we could possibly want. But if you're trying to offer more and more uh, access to mobile broadband in particular, you have one, actually you have two main inputs that are extremely uh, scarce resources and need to be managed in a much more useful and much more effective way in order to keep this party going. Uh, one of those is, is a wireless spectrum. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other one is, uh, is the deployment of cell towers and antennas and sort of other physical infrastructure, and that also has some policy implications I'll mention in a moment. But let me sort of just talk, before I get to the specific, I think what, what I see as the main sort of policy implications for broadband of this uh, Big Bang phenomenon, let me sort of just talk more generally about what I see as the policy implications generally uh, that come with this new form of disruptive innovation. Uh, and a lot of this, I hope, should be clear from the way in which I've introduced it up until now. Uh, as I said in a moment ago, one of the things that we notice is that market discipline uh, increasingly is coming from ecosystem participants. So again, in old-fashioned uh, kind of you know, vertically integrated supply chains, uh, it was very difficult, say, for consumers to really have much influence on over what uh, upstream uh, providers did or didn't do, and certainly on price and service and quality and feature and function. Uh, that's not the case anymore. In these kinds of markets, in fact, every ecosystem participant has a fair amount of, of leverage over the others. And so what we see is that these are very dynamic industries. The you know, sort of the winners and losers at some point look, you know, AOL looks like it's in charge of the internet if you're 
talking about 1998. Well, obviously that's not the case anymore. So even people who are quite dominant, super dominant, Microsoft also in a certain sense, Yahoo, uh, all go through a phase of being what look like very dominant uh, competitors with significant leverage, but in fact because of the pace of technology deflation in price, uh, those, those uh, sort of uh, information empires uh, collapse very quickly or they change very quickly uh, in a very dynamic way, mostly without any need for, uh, for intervention. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, this phenomenon of, of near-perfect market information giving consumers new leverage. I mentioned again in the example of Nintendo. They in some ways drive the product development and product launch schedule. Uh, it's no longer kind of, you know, at the, at the convenience of the manufacturer who wants to get as much life as they can out of an old product before they bring in a replacement product. They don't really have that option uh, anymore because the market knows what's possible and the market will, will tell you in the most unpleasant way possible if you're going too slowly. These information empires, monopolies, duopolies, they aren't really that, again, from an economic standpoint, they may look like that, but it's very temporary. Uh, they rarely have uh, any sort of long-standing effect on, the, on market conditions. Certainly from the standpoint of, of kind of classic antitrust, of thinking about how they harm consumers, you know, most of the monopolies that we have uh, don't charge at all for their products. That's how they become dominant in information industries. Uh, and from sort of tra traditional antitrust, that is really not an issue because there's no particular harm to consumers from a free product. Uh, we do see, uh, particularly in, in intellectual property, copyright and patent, we see incumbents increasingly now, again, if you're suddenly, you know, if you're the GPS uh, uh, device manufacturer uh, or you're the pinball companies and you uh, think things are going really well but then suddenly a new disruptor comes in that radically alters uh, your economic uh, uh, prospects uh, and you weren't prepared for that or you didn't see it coming, uh, you don't really have a lot of strategic options at that point. There's no, you know, five-year planning like we used to do anymore. And so really one of the last uh, vestiges that they've got, one of the last things they can go to is to the courts. Uh, and particularly, I think that's what we're, why we see so much uh, activity and so much uh, sort of negative activity in the area of patents and copyrights. This is sort of, that's kind of what they've got left to fight with. And, uh, and no, that's what they'll do. And I think, you know, whether it's right or wrong is kind of relevant because, in fact, we should expect that will continue whether it is right or wrong, even if we do significant reform uh, to patent or copyright, which, by the way, I think is very unlikely despite all the conversation about it. Um, let me just skip that. So let me just talk about, as I say, how I think this applies particularly to broadband. Uh, again, uh, looking at the, dynam the dynamism of the broadband market and particularly the mobile ecosystem, but also uh, on, the, on the provisioning of uh, voice services, intermodal competition between uh, mobile broadband and wireline broadband and, and, and you know, whether it's being provided by the phone companies or cable companies or satellite companies. What we're seeing here, I think the bottom line is that the kind of traditional role of the regulator in keeping those markets separate is no longer appropriate. Uh, the traditional role of the regulator in sort of assume, you know, sort of assuring that uh, the dominant providers are tightly regulated in terms of uh, price, in terms of service, in terms of, of requirements, things like common carriage, public utility commissions, these are really vestiges of, of a sort of era in which we didn't have this kind of convergence and we didn't have this kind of uh, rapid deflation in technology prices and, and that being visited on products and services uh, coming to market. Uh, so those are particularly, I think, dangerous. In fact, they're quite uh, counterproductive. Uh, in some ways, they sort of build in uh, what turn out to be high prices uh, because they, they don't give incentives to the right parties to continue investing in the cheaper technology. If you're a public utility, you know, why would you, why would you spend money when you can't change your rates uh, to either to pay for the, to the investment, and if you do return the sort of, you know, productivity savings, you're not the one who gets to, uh, to keep it. So very kind of contrary incentives there. Um, secondly, I think it's, uh, as I said before, retiring the, uh, the obsolete switched telephone network. Absolutely essential. I say the consumers are doing it anyway. The carriers are doing it to the extent they can. But it turns out that um, this is very unusual, I think, in, in our research. We didn't find too many examples of this. We have the situation here where the industry that's being devastated, that's being disrupted, let's say the disruptor here is the sort of native IP communications. Okay, well the industry resisted this for a long time. In fact, they denied it for a very long time. But the carriers now are kind of, you know, they've, they've gone through the full grief 
cycle of you know, denial and depression, and now they're in acceptance, and they are trying to move as quickly as they can, which is admirable and something that we should improve, uh, encourage, because again, the IP networks are better and cheaper and, and, uh, and more intimate, so we like that. Uh, what's actually holding them up now are the regulators. So in fact, in, in uh, both a federal and a state level, you need permission to retire obsolete technology uh, and do, to discontinue services, even if you're replacing them with services that are better and cheaper uh, and have a much uh, uh, more competitive uh, uh, influence on the market, you still need permission. And, uh, and in fact, uh, both from a, a state and a federal level, that permission is not being granted. Uh, it's certainly not being granted expeditiously, partly because what it really signals is that, that the regulators go out of business. There's very little role for state regulators once the, the sort of legacy switch networks uh, go out of business and everything is on VoIP or everything is, is, uh, is uh, IP based. There's not really much that's state specific anymore. And the state regulators, whether explicitly or implicitly, know this. And, uh, and they are resisting uh, the, this retirement, even though it's in everybody's economic best interest to push it along. From the standpoint of the uh, incentive auctions, uh, we understand uh, that, uh, you know, we, we, again, as I said, Spectrum is, is one of the most important scarce resources we've got, uh, particularly in, in the mobile space. Uh, Congress did give uh, authority to the FCC now two years ago to try and get back some spectrum from uh, broadcasters, over-the-air television broadcasters. Again, that's a dying technology. It's less and less people rely on it. So that spectrum is not being put to its best use. Uh, and the FCC is trying to design this uh, very complicated set of uh, auctions that will take spectrum back from the broadcasters, then auction it off for mobile broadband, and then share some of the proceeds uh, with the broadcasters and with the, with the Treasury, since it is actually a, a public resource to, to begin with. In the sort of course of this two-year process of designing these auctions, however, uh, many kind of, you know, old-fashioned regulatory ideas are trying to kind of creep back in, both from the FCC and, and from uh, certain lawmakers, saying, well, you know, we have to, again, make sure that we don't have too much domination of uh, spectrum holdings by one or two uh, particular carriers, and so we want to kind of build in rules that will effectively deflate the, the auction price but, but spread the spectrum um, more uh, uh, small doses over any number of carriers. Um, I think, again, that sort of micromanagement might have been appropriate in a time when you had you know, regulated monopolies offering network services, but in this kind of dynamic mobile ecosystem, as we've even seen in the course of since the auction authority was introduced, we've had lots of changes in the, in the mobile ecosystem, even at the carrier level with, with obviously with T-Mobile and, uh, and Metro PCS merging, and now with Sprint uh, being given, you know, sort of uh, competing offers from both DISH and from SoftBank. And so, in fact, uh, uh, the, the idea of using Spectrum as a way of encouraging more competition is uh, extremely bad policy, I think, and one that will probably doom the auctions to, to not have any particular effect whatsoever. Okay. So I'm going to stop there. I have the sort of more general rule about you know, what will lawmakers and regulators should do, but it's not specific here to the, to the broadband space. We've got, you know, three experts here, uh, particularly on how this all applies uh, to broadband, so I will shut up and let them take it from here. So I thought I'd bring a little bit of Southern California. Malibu, our wonderful Pepperdine campus, beachfront property right on PCH. Now most times when I go to other places like, say, Iowa State, they're all, ooh, ah, well, Stanford's pretty nice too. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they're taken out my back window. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the nice faculty housing is up on the hill there. Um, so my name is Jim Frieger. I'm a professor at Pepperdine School of Public Policy. Been there for a few years now. And um, today I wanted to talk a little bit as the, I guess, token academic on the panel of just what some of the research shows, um, in particularly the area of broadband and mobile broadband. Let me, before I tell you what I'm going to do, just show you this is our particular little slice of campus. This is the School of Public Policy here on the right. Um, if you want to put your name on that, I believe the dean would love to talk with you. So that's as yet unnamed. So there are three things that I wanted to cover this morning. Um, the first is just to give a bit of background to where we are with mobile broadband availability and usage. Now, government statistics or official statistics always lag, of course, what's actually going on. So I'm going to be talking about some statistics that are 
probably out of date. Well, we know that they're out of date, but um, as an academic, I will use the official sources, see what we can learn from them. And then I want to talk a little bit about the importance of mobile broadband for um, development and other forms of um, economic growth, particularly in rural areas. And then if I have time at the end, I'll switch a little bit to the question of um, what we used to call the digital divide. Now, I, among academics at least, digital inclusion is the term du jour. It sounds a little better, more positive rather than negative, but focus on you know, what is some of the promise of mobile broadband for some minority communities? And just here's, just to let you know that I'm not completely crazy, or at least we, maybe we all are together, but um, I mean, talking about two pieces of academic research, one of which has undergone peer review, the other is um, still in that process. Okay, so first, what do we know about mobile broadband? First, we'll look at availability. And I'm sure it won't be a surprise to anyone here that yes, there is still at least some of a digital divide among the rural and the urban dimension. But if you're just concerned about getting mobile in some form in rural areas, there aren't that many people who live in census tracts, the, that's what these data are showing, that don't have anything. Okay, so there's only 1.5% of individuals living in census tracts who, as of um, January 1st, 2011, didn't have at least one mobile broadband provider. Now, so it's really a question about choices rather than a yes, no. So if you look at the rest of the pie chart, most of those folks in rural areas, at least as of a couple years ago, had access to one to three providers, whereas in the non-rural areas, you see over half of them had access to um, five or more. So it's really a question of choices more than access, although undoubtedly there are many people who, who still live in rural areas, but percentage-wise, sorry, many people in rural areas who don't have access, but percentage-wise, that's getting very small. Now, this is a map of, again, taking the FCC official data on where mobile broadband providers are and how densely the market is populated in local areas. The first thing that strikes me, which I never actually thought about before, is just how much of the U.S. is actually rural <laughs> when you look at the map. So everything shaded here with the hatching is rural, but of course that's not where hardly anyone lives. Um, so it looks bad. It looks like you see a lot of light colors, and these are the fewer providers. But of course, in terms of the percentage of folks that live there, it's very small. But you, you do see also what we know, areas like Chicago, some of the big cities in Texas, East Coast, um, you know, here in California, we have more competition, more providers. Now, here's something interesting that I looked at using the um, again, the FCC data, and this gets at the question of um, does mobile broadband serve a role of filling in gaps in fixed broadband availability? Now, let me preface this by saying even as of a couple of years ago, there are very few areas that don't have fixed broadband providers. However, let's look at the places that don't. That's this row right here. So the zero means there is no residential fixed broadband provider in the census tract. And by the way, a, a census tract, um, for those of you not familiar with government geography, think of it as smaller than a zip code, but larger than just your street. Okay, so it, it's a relatively small area, although larger in rural areas. Okay, so if you have no fixed broadband provider in the tract at all, there's only three and a half percent chance that you don't have at least one mobile provider. Which is to say that in these areas without fixed broadband providers, almost everyone lives in a census tract that does have some form of mobile access. Which I found very interesting, that mobile seems to be serving this role of filling in gaps. This row, you can say, well, these are folks unserved by fixed broadband. This row, perhaps we could call these the underserved because they don't have as many fixed broadband providers, and again, there does seem to be a role 
a strong role for mobile broadband to be filling out the competitive options available to these folks. Now, do people in rural areas use mobile broadband at the same rate? Now, this is very interesting. The, the previous work, previous slides show that they don't have as much availability. Even without controlling for the lower availability, when you control for things like income, okay, so do an apples to apples comparison, then you get the people living in rural areas have just as much, if not more, demand for mobile broadband. And you, you, know, you can tell some stories about that. The data don't directly speak to that, but you can easily think of the farmer or the ranch hand who needs mobile broadband to, you know, and perhaps even it's built somehow into the um, farming equipment that he or she is using. But I found that interesting as well. And really, you don't have to control for much by way of demographics to get this result. You just have to control for income. Another thing that's interesting is that when you look at people, now these data I should mention are from the current population survey. So this is an official census um, survey of individuals and households about broadband and other forms of technology. If you look at people who use mobile broadband or use fixed broadband in the home or do both, then you find that rural residents among those who use mobile broadband Compare them with their urban counterpart who also uses mobile broadband. The rural resident is much more likely to only use mobile not, and not have fixed, or not use fixed, I should say. So again, it appears to play this um, somewhat of a stronger role, a unique role in rural areas. OK, so let, let's switch gears now a little bit. And instead of just looking at statistics on availability and usage, let's um, step back, take a look at what is the promise for economic development. Now let me just preface this, preface this by saying that I learned from um, the year that I spent back in DC a couple years ago that you see wild claims in this area and you see lots of statistics about how um, you know, broadband in general um, you know, will be the solution to all of society's ills and will bridge all gaps and so forth. Um, what I'm going to talk about here today is I think a more realistic but a more um, convincing story of why broadband might matter. And the notion here is that um, broadband as a general purpose technology, it really, because it is a general purpose technology, it, it plays this fundamental role. And so what is a GPT or a general purpose technology? Um, well, actually, two Stanford professors down the road came up with this terminology and this characterization of it. A GPT is something that is pervasive. It has great potential for technical improvements, very useful to business and commercial endeavor. And I think key, particularly with broadband, would be its potential to increase productivity, both in R&D and in what's going on in downstream, or you could say even in upstream sectors as well. So the quintessential GPT, probably the computer itself. But broadband in general and mobile broadband in particular, I think have, as you look at these characteristics, you can see why we can also think of that as a GPT. And as with other general purpose technologies, this can transform the economy in many different ways because it involves so much at so many different levels. So for example, this makes it very hard to do what these two authors did, which is try to estimate the impact of, in their case, fixed broadband on the US economy because of all the indirect effects. Okay, so the numbers I'll show on this slide have to do with the direct effects of broadband based on it being a consumer product that people buy and value. But think of those indirect effects as well, the new industries that were created by it, the cheaper, better ways of doing things, the disruptions that it causes in other industries. But the best study that we have on the impact of broadband on the economy, I, I say best not because they come up with the biggest numbers, they come up with some of the smallest numbers, but this has the great advantage of them using the same methodology that the official folks back in DC who calculate GDP actually use. 
So you can find larger numbers out there um, with other methodologies. But they do come up with an estimate of, you know, on the order of $10 billion as of several years ago for the impact of broadband on GDP. But now remember or learn something about GDP. Um, it only measures, it's, it's good at measuring money that actually changes hands. But what does it mean if I subscribe to broadband and I'm willing to pay $50 a month for a service? Well, as an economist, I teach my students, that means that the consumer is willing to pay at least that much to get it, and it's worth more than $50 to me. Economists call that extra value that we get that is not reflected in the market transaction consumer surplus. And their methodology allows them to measure that as well, and that adds several billion dollars more to the impact. These numbers would undoubtedly be much larger today with the larger take up of the service and also the new forms of broadband like mobile that we have. Let's just quickly run through the academic literature on the impacts that broadband can have on economic development. Um, won't mention all the names by name here, but lots of good people have done good work. And what you find is that broadband is positively associated with employment growth in the United States. Um, Sharon Gillette and others have found that broadband is also positively correlated with employment growth, new business formation, property values in areas that have higher take up. Jed Kolko has done, um, actually I think he's up here in the Bay Area, PPIC. Um, he's done some work also showing that it's related to economic, local economic growth, I should say. Now, there are lots of uh, potential problems that you can fall into here, and I'm sure that you've thought of these already. As I'm mentioning some of these results, things like, well, of course, areas that are growing faster would both be growing faster, have job growth, and get more broadband. Um, let me just say, I'm only citing studies here where they did wrestle with these confounding factors in various ways, um, but came up with credible results. Now, just to keep the literature honest, let me do mention the one thing that they do not find and is very hard to find in the literature is um, correlations between broadband and wage growth. So you get more jobs. Um, it's hard to prove a link that you get better paying jobs, which is interesting. Probably just it's hard to tease that out in the data. Okay, so that's development in general. What about rural areas in particular? Um, so here's where you know, only your imagination limits you <laughs> to the things that um, you can think about of why broadband might matter even more for rural areas than urban areas. Um, community involvement is more difficult in areas where people are spread out and lack the natural foci in you know, the community center that an urban area might have. Um, so telepresence um, and broadband can help with that. Telework, of course, um, telecommuting, as it used to be called. Of course, that cuts both ways. Um, if you can work from home by telework from rural Indiana, then it can probably also be done from rural India. Um, so it's not clear that that's always a good thing for the U.S. job market. But clearly, it does allow um, workers in the rural workforce to expand their opportunities. Distance learning has had great take up in rural areas. And then, of course, um, telemedicine has many obvious applications. Now, one of the best studies that looked at the impact specifically in rural areas of broadband is some work done by Peter Stenberg. And he came up with a clever methodology of looking at um, matched pairs of rural counties that were similar in all regards in terms of demographics and so forth, except that some of them had more broadband available. Okay, so it's kind of a treatment and control group where dosing the county with broadband was the treatment. And his matching methodology revealed that those rural counties that were early adopters of broadband did have significantly more job growth, again, not in wages, but in number of jobs, population, and in personal income. So it really does appear to matter. You can also say, well, you know, we only have one United States to study, but we can um, draw analogies from the international development literature 
and say to the extent that less developed countries um, might look a bit like rural areas, we can look at that literature. And that literature has the advantage of um, looking at mobile broadband usage in particular, which is obviously very important in many less developed countries where they don't have the, f the copper or the fiber in the ground. And so they've jumped perhaps um, directly to mobile. And so here's one study that found that in these less developed areas, um, that's where you get the highest impact of the positive effect of mobile broadband on GDP per household. And also you can look at the efficiency of the economy, the gap between what they could be producing given their resources, that's their potential GDP, and their actual GDP, and mobile broadband also appears to impact that as well. Okay, so do I have time to talk about minorities? Okay, so let me just finish up here looking at the promise of broadband or what it has to offer in particular to some minority communities. And again, this is where we want to be modest in our claims. Um, 30 years ago, no doubt, no doubt people said that computers would, be, would solve all social inequities. And if we just got computers in the schools, that would solve everything. However, there are some very realistic and reasonable things that we can look at here. So for example, and one of the things that I like to do since, and let me just step back here for a moment. So I go to lots of conferences on digital divide, digital inclusion, drawing people from all parts of the academy. So not all hard-nosed economists who like to put numbers to things. And one of the things I've realized is that a lot of times academics or others tend to impose what we think should happen with technology in a particular community. And I actually liked, I, I picked out some statistics here. Of, let's let the communities to speak for themselves. And then as an economist, I like to look at what they actually do rather than what they say. So I'll, I'll look at both of these sorts of statistics here. So for example, in the area of jobs, um, you survey um, people from across the spectrum of US society and you will find that more likely than whites, it's the uh, African American and Hispanic community that is talking about the importance of broadband when they don't have it in looking for employment. Here's an interesting statistic. African Americans are more likely than others to take online classes. And of course, the way uh, modern university online classes run, that means broadband. You can't do that with dial-up or any, anything less than good speed. Regarding civic engagement, um, a lot of research came out of the 2008 election time and since then, showing that minority communities, particularly again among African Americans, um, view things like social media as very important to community involvement and engagement. And then with healthcare, um, again, with certain types of applications that have to do with healthcare, um, African American community, again, perhaps due to not as much access of physical presence of healthcare in some of their communities, um, appear to rely more heavily on things like mobile health applications. And so there's great promise there as the quality of these applications develops. Okay, so a lot of what I just mentioned just had to do with broadband in general. So what's the specific link to mobile broadband for these communities? Well, this was very interesting, um, the story that the statistics tell here. So if you want to talk about a digital divide, you will still find one. And it is true that African Americans and Hispanics in the US do use broadband less overall. And that's true whether you just look at the raw numbers, and that's what we have here in this first row. So for example, if you want to compare um, blacks with non-Hispanic whites, you will find that if you ask them, do you have broadband in your home of any kind, fixed or mobile, 18 percentage points lower take up. Okay, so there is a gap. Same is true for Hispanics, a 22 percent uh, percentage point gap in usage. And it's not just due to the things that you might suspect that they might be lower income on average. You control for demographics, and this is um, 
work that I've done in those articles that I mentioned earlier. So I'm using a matching estimator here to control for confounding factors like family size, um, income, the usual sorts of sociodemographic characteristics. And these gaps persist even after controlling for things like income. However, that's not true of mobile broadband. And this is the part that I really found interesting. Now, I do need to preface this slide by saying that I think the government survey, the CPS data that I was able to analyze here, probably does a pretty bad job of how it asks its questions because the numbers of people that say that they use mobile broadband at all are very, very low, suspiciously low in the survey. So these gaps here, these are all much smaller numbers, whether they're positive or negative, but that's just because only a small percentage of people are saying that they did it at all. But again, let's compare um, African Americans to non-Hispanic whites. The question here is, do you access the internet on your mobile phone? That's one of the ways that this question is asked. The raw gap, in other words, you do find that fewer African Americans um, will use, or say that they use the internet on their phone, but once you control for things like income, it apparently is more important to them. Because now, if, so the way to read this figure here is take an observably similar, in terms of demographics, um, person in a white household, person in a black household, the person in the black household, when you compare apples to apples that way, is actually you know, a bit more likely to access the internet on his mobile phone or on her mobile phone. And that is um, statistically significant. For Hispanics, it's less clear. The difference shrinks. Um, there's some different estimates here that I haven't put on the slide. The evidence is a bit inconclusive, but Basically, the story for Hispanics is that, yes, if you don't control for anything, they're less likely to use mobile broadband, um, but that mostly goes away once you control for demographics. So just to wrap up, um, it is still true, apparently, that mobile broadband is less available in rural areas, but it doesn't appear to be used any less in rural areas than in urban areas. Uh, broadband in general, mobile broadband in particular, appears to be a significant, has the potential to be a significant driver of growth for rural areas. And again, uh, mobile uh, broadband in general and mobile broadband in particular, um, again, appears to be quite important to some minority communities. And so might play a special role in um, relieving some inequities or giving greater access to things like civic engagement, healthcare, and so forth in that arena. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rich Clark. I'm with AT&T. And uh, I'd like to talk to you, first of all, and note that you've seen all these wonderful presentations that have told you about how disruptive broadband can be and how useful it is for both digital inclusion and economic development. Uh, but my task here is a little bit different. Uh, I'm here to tell you about what are the inputs into this secret sauce that make mobile networks able to supply the capacity that they do in order to provide all of these things. Now, you've heard perhaps in the press some people suggesting that there is no shortage of spectrum and that U.S. mobile carriers can meet exploding demand requirements for their services simply by improving their technologies, uh, perhaps sharing some spectrum, and investing a lot, lot more. Uh, I'm afraid I'm kind of here to either not, maybe not to just take the punch bowl away from that party, but at least to drain the alcohol out of it. Uh, and uh, report on some analyses that suggest that uh, there is no one single silver bullet or even two single silver bullets, two, two double single <laughs> silver bullets, that can cure this, uh, this challenge that we face and that it's going to be a combination of every input needing to be expanded and made more productive in order for us to uh, uh, really provide these good mobile services that people want to have done. So my presentation is first of all going to start and talk about, well, what is the challenge that we face? 
Uh, and then what are the different methods that we do have available to expand capacity? I'm going to look a little bit about how effective each of these methods has been over the last uh, roughly 30 years of experience, as well as how effective we believe they're going to be in the future. But to presage the answer, uh, we're going to see that without a lot more raw spectrum, all of the other methods by themselves will not be able to keep up with forecasted demand. Uh, in the alternative, if we don't continue to innovate, invest, and deploy more raw spectrum, Unfortunately, the way the market will equilibrate is through price adjustments that tend to uh, reduce the amount, uh, raise the price of services, uh, reduce to repress the demand for them, and uh, perhaps deliver less of the uh, economic benefits and social benefits that we think mobile broadband is going to provide. Now, before I go on, I have to point out this little box in red underneath there, and the lawyers tell me I even have to recite it directly to everybody, uh, to note that the analyses and data presented in this paper are not intended to portray the U.S. mobile, or, or excuse me, are intended to portray the U.S. mobile services industry on a national average basis. They may not be representative of any particular geographic region or mobile operator within the U.S., including AT&T. I have not used any proprietary AT&T data in performing these analyses. The conclusions developed are solely those of myself and should not be construed as representing any official position of AT&T. That said, I hope they still remain credible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first of all, let's go and look at what, what's the challenge that we're facing. And Everybody's probably seen this chart before. The challenge is that there's just been a huge increase in demand for mobile services, uh, particularly mobile data services. You see the, uh, the, yellow, ouch, the yellow bars there that uh, represent voice demand, and that has pretty much flattened out over the last several years and even has declined a little bit in the last year or two as people are substituting more and more uh, other mobile communication techniques for making a voice phone call. And if any of you have kids, you'll know that they never make any voice phone calls, that they uh, will, and they won't answer yours either. Uh, so the, 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 there's other communications methods. But it's the orange bars that are telling you what's really happening in this industry, and that is that the demand for mobile capacity, for mobile data capacity, is what is skyrocketing. Now, the other thing I want to note here is that these data are from Ericsson, uh, and their mobile traffic does not include Wi-Fi offload. Wi-Fi offload is just your mobile device has a Wi-Fi chip and communicates to your fixed broadband line in your home. And that's measured as an increase in fixed broadband traffic. Mobile broadband traffic is strictly stuff that goes over the radio link from your phone to a cell tower, not that travels via a uh, fixed broadband link through the internet. So I know there's been suggestions out there that uh, increases in mobile u in uh, Wi-Fi offload will be the panacea for this. No, the challenge that we're facing is for mobile traffic. And in addition to that, there's a huge amount more of traffic that's going off of mobile devices and going directly into Wi-Fi. But that's that's separate and above these these data here. Okay, but that was the past. What's going to happen in the future? Well, the forecasts that we see, Ericsson's forecasts tend to be global forecasts, whereas Cisco forecasts these things at a regional level. And so I wanted to look at the North America slash US forecast that Cisco has for demand for voice and data terabytes of mobile traffic. And Cisco also excludes Wi-Fi offload from its figures so that they are con consistent. And you see, uh, you know, we're here today, pretty small, but 
uh, at an average growth rate that for the next number of years is going to be 50% a year, and then I project even to decline a certain amount by then so that by 2022 it reaches essentially what the rate we see in growth in fixed broadband traffic, uh, you still have a very high sled <laughs> slope to climb in terms of the amount of demand that you need to satisfy. Uh, how correct are these, are, the, are, are these forecasts? Well, we don't know. This is based on Cisco's most recent forecast that was put out a couple of months ago, which is substantially more conservative in uh, estimating lower demand growth than its previous ones. But I have to note that there are other entities out there, Qualcomm is one, that has projected growth rates that are nearly double the growth rates that both Cisco and Ericsson have projected. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's just too depressing to, uh, to try to think that we ever, would ever be able to match those, uh, those growth rates. So I'm going to use the Cisco ones for my modeling. OK, so that's the challenge, to meet that exploding demand. What are the tools that we have available in order to do this? Well, the one that everybody knows about, <clears throat> The most straightforward way to increase capacity is if you have more radio <coughs> spectrum. By deploying more radio spectrum, your capacity increases pretty much in proportion to the amount of spectrum that you have. Uh, unfortunately, the spectrum that's really most usable for mobile wireless services, that between about you know, 500 megahertz and 3,500 uh, 3, megahertz, is first of all scarce and huge portions of it are being used for television services or for various government services. Uh, now, there are attempts being made currently that we certainly hope will bear fruit to try to be able to transfer some of the spectrum that's being used for television to mobile broadband and by the government to mobile broadband. You've heard uh, these talk about the voluntary incentive auctions for the television uh, spectrum. So we hope that, but even the best, most fond hopes for that think that maybe we'll get a net of maybe 100 megahertz out of it. Uh, I'd love to find out that it's going to be more than that, but I think if I was going to take the over-under, I'd probably take the under. Uh, uh, government uses very large amounts of spectrum, uh, primarily by the Defense Department, but by many other agencies too. But neither of these entities thus far, either the TV broadcasters or government, has had any economic incentive to give it up. Now, again, with the voluntary <coughs> incentive auction for broadcasters, there's an attempt being made to provide them with an economic incentive. And just this past week, or maybe it was last week, there was an announcement by the uh, White House that there is going to be uh, an effort by the government to uh, try to get agencies to figure out ways that they can economize on their uses of spectrum uh, uh, so that maybe they can relinquish some of it. But the key is going to be to find some sort of mechanism that provides these agencies the economic incentive to, to do so. And uh, uh, there's a big reward, if not on earth, in heaven for anybody who figures how to, how, how to do that. Uh, but if you look at the history of US spectrum growth, uh, well, I mean, the first allocations were made in the early 80s, and this uh, blue uh, or purple thing is what spectrum was used for 1G or the old analog services, and those were finally decommissioned in 2006. Uh, then there was this auction of PCS spectrum in the, about 1994 that takes the total line up here, and you know, spectrum, once it's auctioned, only it takes a couple years to actually build the networks to deploy it. So now you're seeing, seeing the deployment of that spectrum in this, uh, I don't know, so what, what the color is? Red. <laughs> <laughs> Dull red uh, ochre or whatever color. <laughs> uh, but as you see, uh, that's reached its peak about uh, five or six years ago. And we're gradually reducing the amount of spectrum that's being used for 2G services. Uh, 
And then now at this point in time, you have the AWS auctions and the 700 megahertz auctions that take us up to this amount of total deployed spectrum. And here we're seeing the amount that's being used for 3G services. And then beginning here, you see some 4G services uh, being put out. Uh, now, one of the big questions people have is, well, this is the spectrum, my calculations of the spectrum that's actually being used currently by these two technologies, these, these three technologies. Uh, but we have all this stuff that was allocated that hasn't been used yet. What, 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 what is it? Well, the hugest amount of this is spectrum that's in what we call the BRS or EBS uh, bands uh, at about 2,500 uh, megahertz which is largely owned by Clearwire. And depending on what happens with the current uh, you know, merger uh, issues or acquisition issues for Clearwire, we may or may not see that spectrum begin to be used uh, more intensively than it currently is. But most of that is, is that. Uh, so all's well and good here that we have had a large amount of increase of spectrum from 50 megahertz back in the early 80s to uh, roughly 550 or 548 now. Uh, but this is the line of the amount of traffic that's being handled. And the, the, uh, the legend for that line is, uh, is on the right-hand side. And so what you see is that we've had you know, a factor of 100,000 or so in terms of the amount of traffic that's being carried, even though we've only had a factor of uh, about 10 in terms of the increase in spectrum over this time. So the question is, well, how, how has that been able to happen? How, if we've only had spectrum go up by a factor of 10, we've had uh, traffic be able to go up by 100,000? Well, there's been two answers to that. One is we've moved to these more efficient technologies. If you look at the efficiency with which 1G services were able to carry bits, uh, it was pretty much maybe a tenth of a bit per hertz that they could carry. 2G was getting up to about a quarter of a bit per hertz. You needed four hertz to carry one bit per second. Uh, 3G had initially uh, was about half a bit per second per hertz. As we go up to the more advanced 3G type services, uh, we got up to about 0 0.9, 0 0.95. But now we're beginning to move to LTE. The first generation of LTE, which is being deployed right now, gets about 1.4 bits per second per hertz. And in another two years or so, we're going to be going to what's called for LTE advanced. And hopefully that will take us up to about 2.25 uh, bits per second per hertz. So if you think of spectrum, the amount of hertz as gas, this is the miles you're getting per gallon of gas. And we're getting more efficient technologies that give you more miles per gallon or bits per second per hertz. So if you look at actually, uh, you multiply the amount of megahertz of spectrum of these different uh, different uh, technologies by the efficiency with which they handle traffic, you can see that uh, right now the GSM, even though it has a substantial amount of spectrum, the 2G still has a substantial amount of traffic, uh, spectrum only handles a small amount of traffic. 3G is probably the biggest hauler. 4G in 2012 was, uh, was catching up. My guess is by 2013, this end of this year, 4G will be handling uh, more traffic than, uh, than everything else put together, just because how quickly those networks are expanding. So more efficient technologies is one way we've been able to handle this issue of spectrum only going by a factor of 10, traffic going up by a factor of 100,000. The other is what we call increased reuse of spectrum. By deploying more towers and splitting cells, capacity within an area is able to be increased, that you can reuse the frequencies in nearby areas. And this has been done intensively. If you go back to the early, uh, the middle 80s, you only had a few thousand cell towers in the country. And now we have over 300,000 in the country. So that you're able to reuse this by uh, taking these large cells and subdividing them out and putting in more towers and things like this. And all well and good, 
But unfortunately, this is a pretty expensive method of increasing your capacity because the costs of it scale fairly linearly with the cell counts that you need to put up a new tower, you need to get new uh, fiber backhaul from that tower into the fixed network. And indeed, you've got that, and you also have the problem of all the good sites have been taken. That you, take, you, you try to go to the most uh, advantageous places to put your cell tower, both for the amount of coverage you get and for your cost of placing that cell tower in terms of how you know, the rental of the location and the cost of backhaul to it. But as you've gone through your inventory of good locations, now you're in the inventory of not as good locations. So it's even questionable as whether the capacity is going and, and per unit of cost is going to be the same, follow the same linear pattern, or whether it's going to become less efficient in the future. But it's been these two things that have allowed us to keep pace. That if you look at the amount of spectrum we've had times the spectral capacity of newer technologies. This is a logarithmic index of capacity growth. Uh, we've gone from number one, uh, index number of one in 1985 up to uh, something that's about uh, 100 times that in uh, 2012. Uh, by, for round of extra reuse by duplicating cell towers. We've gone from, again, that index of one in 1985 up to an index of, uh, oh, it's about 300 or so uh, by uh, 2012. And if you multiply these two together, these two things together, the better technologies, the more spectrum and the increased reuse, you get this green line that gives us the total amount of increase in capacity we've had over this uh, this 35-year, 27-year uh, period. And gone up pretty impressively. As you said, we've got an increase in capacity of roughly getting up to 100,000 times what it was in, uh, in 1985. But the bad news is, is it's this dotted line that we have to keep ahead of. That's the amount by which traffic has gone up over this time. And we're still slightly ahead. I mean, I know it looks like we, how, how did we live during this period, but my, uh, <laughs> that's why I have uh, that, uh, uh, I, uh, my calculations really, I don't really know how networks handled uh, equivalence and voice back in the early days of analog uh, type things. So I, would, uh, I, I would, wouldn't trust the figures so much from back in the dark ages then. Uh, but the challenge is how do we keep that green line above that, uh, that dotted black line? So we have to look at whether the these implementation of these tools in the future is going to be adequate. Well, what are the tools we're going to have? The biggest one, or one of the biggest ones, is uh, the newest technologies, 4G LTE and LTE Advanced. Uh, these offer substantial improvements through all sorts of alphabet soup type uh, engineering advantages in terms of how much many bits per hertz they can, bits per second they can pack into each hertz. Uh, things that are orthogonal frequency division multiple access, uh, multiple input, multiple output transmissions where you actually have several antennas in your, your phone and several antennas that are all transmitting simultaneously and they take advantage of the different delays by the fact that this antenna set, sends out a signal one nanosecond, the, 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 the signal from this antenna in your phone reaches the cell tower about one nanosecond later than the one that was uh, closer, that an inch and a half closer in your phone. Uh, uh, coordinated multi-point transmission makes, is the, actually having your phone be simultaneously communicating with more than one cell tower at the time. And all of these things put together uh, make 4G LTE roughly 45% more efficient than what our 3G technologies. And as we go to LTE advanced, uh, we're going to increase our uh, improvement over 3G by about 135%. But there's other advantages with these new technologies. One is that 4G LTE, LTE advanced, makes more functional the use of small cells. That right now there's these things out there called femtocells or whatever that you may plug in and that they communicate uh, directly through the internet back to the, the cell company. But the problem is, is that they're not integrated in with the main cellular network. You'll drop calls moving from one to the other. 
uh, LTE Advanced allows you to have soft handoffs between regular cell towers and things like femto cells. So all of this makes it more economic to more intensively reuse spectrum in small cells. So that's a great advantage. Another big advantage is that uh, LTE has got far less latency in its transmissions than the earlier technologies. And because it has less latency, it can work for providing VoIP service for voice, as opposed to if you had long latency transmissions, VoIP sounds choppy and people talk over one another. So it's got low enough latency so that voice can be provided as a data application over LTE. And instead of having spectrum being used right now as it is for kind of data networks and then separate voice specific networks, uh, you can just have a bigger data network and use voice as an application so you get greater what we call packing efficiency by sticking all these applications into one big network as opposed to separating them out over two different networks. So all of this is wonderful, but the penalty for success here is because these technologies are so much more capable, far faster, have lower latency, they increase the functionality of mobile wireless services, which just makes people want more. Uh, it's a great problem to have, but it's a <laughs> represents a problem nonetheless. So how do we think these contributions will help you know, address our problems as we go forward. Well, improvement in network packing over the next uh, 20 years or eight, eight years is going to improve our uh, effective capacity carrying capability by a little bit. But still welcome. Uh, the increase of reuse that we may get by LTE making small cells more efficient is going to be more uh, important and over this period of time may increase uh, uh, the carrying capacity of the network by its, uh, itself by a factor of roughly three. Uh, and then as we go to migration to higher G technologies, as we steadily turn off the 2G technologies and indeed turn off the 3G technologies and turn off the, the initial LTE technologies in favor of LTE advanced, we're going to get another lift percentage lift in capacity. And the other thing is, how about building out spectrum? As you noted from that earlier chart, we haven't built out all the, the 548 megahertz that we currently have. That you know, They say Clearwire has pretty much left most of his unused. Uh, so we still have a bit of room to run there. But assuming that that gets all built out by 2006 and nothing more gets allocated, that's the amount of spectrum you have. Now. The FCC is trying to allocate roughly 300 more megahertz over this period. And uh, we hope they will, but so far they're kind of behind the, uh, the time pattern that they need to be on in order for it to come out over this period of time. But if they do start allocating 300 megahertz over this period of time, and let's say they effectively it's begun in 2013, uh, all these lines change from their solid points to their dotted points where uh, you get that much of spectrum improvement and you get that much of uh, better, uh, quicker ability to move to LTE advance and things like that. So you would get those type of things. Uh, but to figure out whether the combination of improved network packing, improved uh, reuse, improved tech migration to higher technologies, and more spectrum, whether that's adequate to meet what demand is going to be, means we've got to multiply all of these different improvement factors together with one another, uh, which we do, and we get this red line. However, the red line can be juiced up a bit if we get the 300 megahertz more spectrum. Now, note that this is a logarithmic scale, so uh, these, this is really going up like that if it was a, if it was a linear scale. But we get that uh, improvement. But what does it have to meet? It's got to meet that forecast of what we think demand growth is going to be, and that's the blue line there. And what we see is, well, 300 megahertz more of 
spectrum is going to be helpful, it probably isn't quite enough to meet the project, for projected demand. Uh, you know, if you look at my model, uh, the figure, the magic number that I come up with that we would need to have deployed by 2022 is 560 megahertz more spectrum, just to keep pace with this forecasted demand growth. So, in summary here, you know, mobile wireless technology has become more capable. They've got faster speeds, lower latency, greatly improved data carrying capacity. But demand right now is growing faster. And meeting this challenge is going to require all legs of this stool. We need to aggressively move to these more capable technologies and hopefully, you know, I saw Larry talk about 5G, hopefully that technology will, uh, will be even better and help, uh, help us along. We're going to need far more intensive spectrum reuse. We're going to have to hugely increase the number of effective cell towers that we have. But in the end, we're also going to need a lot more raw spectrum. And unless we fire on all of these cylinders, the unfortunate alternative is that we may have to expect some rising prices that would uh, suppress desirable usage growth. So I look forward to the discussion. Well, good morning, everyone, um, and good afternoon to those on the, on the East Coast who are watching this via the live stream. Uh, my name is Hal Singer. I'm a managing director at Navigant Economics. I'm also a senior fellow at a think tank in D.C. called PPI. Um, I, uh, I, I'm batting cleanup today, and after those three uh, initial speeches, I'm feeling quite intimidated. I get the sense that these guys might do this a bit more than I do. I'm, I'm a mere writer. Uh, but every once in a while, I crawl out of the, the cubicle and have to confront the public or some judge. So um, I thought, uh, given that we're streaming, um, it might make sense. Um, this is an idea that just occurred to me from having to watch so much So You Think You Can Dance and The Voice. I've got, I've got two young girls that uh, at the end of today's show, whichever speaker you like the best, you ought to just text their number. And for me, I'm, I'm, I'm number four. You should text it to the uh, Pepperdine School of Public Policy and the dean will, will announce uh, shortly thereafter who won. Um, so uh, I, I've been asked to, to uh, talk today about uh, a book that I wrote uh, with Bob Lighton, uh, who is now the director of research at, at Bloomberg, uh, titled The Need for Speed. Uh, Brookings uh, published it uh, this year. And uh, you all should race out and download a copy of that off, off of Amazon. But um, so I won't spoil it for you. I'll just give you a little teaser today. The, um, what the book is about in very broad strokes is um, the notion of what role, if any, is left for a regulator like the FCC, uh, given the convergence of technologies uh, that are afoot uh, that all provide data, voice, and, and um, video. If you think about the, the, the mindset around the time that uh, these regulations were written, and, 30s and 40s, um, we were really dealing with, with the monopolist, a true uh, single platform, and now we have multiple platforms when you think about wireless and satellite and fiber and uh, cable. Um, so it, it really does uh, tee up a very legitimate and tough question, which is, is there any role left uh, for regulation? Now, we would have titled the book uh, the, the Future of the FCC, but we think it would have depressed sales. So we, we needed something a little sexier, and that's a need for speed, colon, um, rethinking communications policy. So that's, that's the background. And, and let me tell you um, um, the, what's going on in D.C. Actually, I, I testified last week in front of Congress on, on this very issue. There is a movement afoot um, by various uh, incumbent providers, cable providers, telcos, to, to repeal now these, these, um, these acts, the Cable Act. Telcos are asking for relief from certain legacy regulation. Um, and, and the common refrain that you hear is that we have so much platform competition. Uh, we already have an apparatus in place to take care of uh, consumers. It's called the antitrust laws. And so why not, just, uh, why not just take a step back and whenever something bad happens, we can let an antitrust court step in. And there is some merit to that argument, but I do think there are limits. And so what I'm going to talk about today are some of those limits. Um, to give you a, a quick background on, on my perspective of things, um, I, I have served as an expert in a bunch of uh, discrimination cases in the video space, both in what are called program carriage cases, 
I was the expert for the NFL Network and for Tennis Channel and for Mid-Atlantic Sports Network, and then in program access cases. Um, and so that, that gives me, um, I think, a, a unique perspective on how one should go about setting up a process to adjudicate disputes that are likely to arise in the, in the Internet. Uh, I also do a lot in the antitrust space. Um, and so uh, for that reason, when, when someone says to me, rip apart uh, the FCC, rip apart all the regs, and just let antitrust go, I, I, I say, well, hold on. I, that, that is going to be good for most things, but there might be a few exceptions. So that's the, the long windup. Um, I, I've given you guys a, a reading list on this slide. Um, it, this is good nighttime reading. It'll, um, it'll put you to bed um, in case you're having a hard time. But the first one I've already mentioned. Uh, today what I'm going to do, um, it kind of reminds me when, when I was 15, I think I used to make cassette recordings of my favorite songs for like a girlfriend. So this is going to be a mashup of, uh, of the singer's greatest hits. Um, all, all, all at once, because um, you guys wouldn't want me to fly out five times and give five separate speeches. Um, uh, and so um, you, you can see by the titles, uh, everything is out currently. The, on, the only one that's not out, it's, it's about to come out. It's in the uh, Federal Communications Law Journal, um, where uh, I, I'm looking at um, the kind of misbehavior that's gone on in the secondary uh, markets uh, process uh, for, for wireless spectrum at the FCC. So what should be the proper scope of, of regulation? And I, and I have this big idea here, which is um, let's, let's agree that we don't need duplicative regulation where antitrust already um, pr protects consumers, OK? Um, and, and what regulation should be doing instead, this is my big thesis, is to fill a gap in antitrust, uh, in antitrust enforcement. Um, and as you'll see, as we progress across this, this uh, slide presentation, that will imply uh, a, a much more limited role for the FCC because the FCC is doing everything right now. Um, it, it, and it, not, not because it's the FCC's fault, it's really Congress uh, mandated that it get in certain areas that are actually perfectly overlapping with antitrust enforcement. Um, and what, what uh, Bob Light and my co-author and I advocate in this book is that we should, we should pare the FCC down and let's, let's try to get them just into those spaces uh, that, that antitrust law might, might uh, overlook. And, and the big idea, and it's the last bullet here, is that I do think that if we can identify a harm that is not, and here's the big million dollar word, co cognizable, we need to come up with, this is not an economist's term, this is a lawyer's term, how about not recognized by antitrust law. Antitrust might not care about, about certain harms that we as a society care about. And if, that, and if we care enough, then, then we can convince ourselves that we need some regulation, just a hint of regulation, um, to protect uh, in that circumstance. So if, if regulation is going to be what's left over uh, from antitrust, then you have to understand what antitrust is doing. Um, and so let me, let me spend a, a, a bit of time on that. What, what I think antitrust is principally concerned about is, the, is to stop the exercise of market power. And what, what sends off the, the alarm bells over at the DOJ or the FTC? It's a, it's a price increase or it's an output reduction. This is the harm that is cognizable, there's that million dollar word again, uh, by antitrust. And it's what, it's what generally um, is going to get a firm or a group of firms in trouble. Um, to, to prosecute a case, however, uh, and, and to win, uh, you have to get over this darn monopoly power requirement. It turns out to be a good thing. It's this notion that really no one firm or group of firms could exercise power this way unless they are monopolists. And there are direct ways to try to measure, uh, try to demonstrate that a firm is a monopolist in a market. This would be direct evidence that the firm has raised prices over competitive levels or has, or has kept out entrance. But what courts and often regulators tend to rely on instead are, are indirect measures, and these are market shares. Um, so you have to define a relevant market, and then you have to measure the shares. And this isn't a rule of thumb, but it's kind of a, this isn't a hard and fast rule. It's more of a rule of thumb. But, but if you're going after someone with, with less than 50 percent market share, uh, you're, you're, you're not going to get very far in an antitrust court. You're, you're pretty much going to get laughed out. Um, so uh, I find this to be helpful um, because when we look at the next slide, 
you can just imagine hypothetically how successful would a plaintiff be uh, in today's fairly competitive environment in prosecuting uh, an antitrust case against uh, an incumbent provider. So let's, let's go through these, um, these uh, statistics. My bottom line is would be not, not much, not, not, much not, not much success at all. Let me, let me tell you that I got all of these stats from the most recent available data from the FCC, and that, that isn't all that impressive because the FCC is fairly slow to put, put that out. Um, but let me tell you what, uh, what it tells us. Um, if you just look right there, you, you are at about a, 50%, a 58 percent uh, average local share for the incumbent cable operator when it comes to video uh, subscriptions. Um, and you uh, drop down to uh, about 23 percent if you measure it in terms of total nationwide subscribers. Now why is that? And the answer is that because the cable operators, as you're probably aware, don't have a ubiquitous footprint. Instead, they just cover up little pockets of the country. So not to pick on my favorite company, but Comcast in a given market could have as high as 70 percent local market share, but because their footprint is limited, they're only controlling about 23 percent of nationwide subs. Um, now let's move into wireline broadband. And I, I did this cut intentionally. Um, and boy, this, this really gets people worked up in DC when you talk about how to define it. But the FCC thinks that there is this magical threshold, that there's something magical about three megabits per second down. I've seen four megabits per second down, depending upon what, what, what report you're looking at, as, as what, what constitutes broadband. And they're ready to ignore anything that's slower. But I wanted to give you two different cuts. Um, if you, if you include, and this is the first cut right here, if you include all connections, this would include DSL, all connections that exceed 200 kilobits per second, the average local share for the cable operator is uh, 56 percent. Um, if you exclude DSL and you, and you impose this, this 3 megabit per second, uh, and again, these are fairly dated. This is as of June of 2011, but to, don't hate the messenger. This is literally the latest data available at the FCC. Um, it's at 71 percent. Um, again, on a nationwide share, uh, uh, we're at 23 percent, which is fairly low. You can do the same thing for wireless, and there you don't get any divergence between uh, the, the average local and the, and the largest national because um, the four major carriers are basically operating everywhere. So what's the, what's the takeaway from this? Well, uh, you wouldn't be very successful. Let's go to the obvious one. You wouldn't be very successful in an antitrust court pursuing a, a case, at least a unilateral conduct case. Uh, in the wireless space. And you also wouldn't be successful um, pursuing a case involving, say, nationwide foreclosure against a, against a cable operator with the 23 percent share of the largest. Um, um, same thing for wireless broadband. You might be able to, to, to assert, let me just go back before you lose these numbers, the 58, if you keep the 58, 56, and 71, you might not be laughed out of court um, uh, if you were trying to assert some kind of story about uh, abusing local market power um, against against one of those wireline operators. But my, my, my bottom line takeaway here is that there is little scope for antitrust enforcement uh, given uh, the competitive nature. So, and why do I say this? Well, if, if someone uh, tells you that, that we want to lean on antitrust uh, and, and rip apart the regulatory apparatus, um, you should just understand what that implies. It pretty much means that we're going to be in a, in a deregulated or um, uh, largely laissez-faire uh, environment, which is fine for just some, but I just want uh, everyone to be cognizant of, of what would happen then. So <clears throat> let me try to figure out then what, what is it that, that antitrust might not catch that we as a society could care about. So of course antitrust is going to take care of things like mergers and conspiracies. Um, exclusive dealing, tying, bundling. And what, again, what, what, what each of these has in common uh, is that uh, they will generate a price effect. And that's what, that's what the courts are going to be on the lookout for, a price effect or an output reduction. When, when, when conduct generates something other than a price effect, um, and I'm going to argue there is, there, is a, there is a type of conduct that does that, namely discrimination by a vertically integrated platform provider. Um, there, is, there may be no associated price effect. Now, there may be some. I'll give you some examples where there are some. But when there's not, um, and the harm that is generated by the conduct is this kind of nebulous idea of, of loss of innovation, loss of diversity, I don't think the antitrust laws are going to be very sympathetic uh, to, to a complainant or to a plaintiff in those cases. 
Um, let, me, let me give you an example of um, where I think the, the hole is or the gap is in antitrust enforcement. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you as to whether or not the gap should be filled uh, with, with regulation. But let's, uh, let's talk very quickly about these three case studies. You know, Google was, was under the microscope uh, for most of 2012 um, uh, with respect to its mild favoritism of its, of its own websites over those of rivals. So Google could, or at least was alleged to be steering traffic um, through its ranking process. Uh, when people used its, its search engine, um, there was an allegation that Google would try to direct you to Google's websites. And the FTC took a hard look at this case, and despite uh, the leanings of the current administration, decided not to pursue uh, an antitrust case against Google. And, and I think the reason why they, why they did is because they recognized, they looked at the likelihood of, of their succeeding in such a case and recognized that antitrust law isn't, and, and, and jurisprudence isn't all that helpful in going inside of a firm and making it change its conduct. Um, and, and so rather than try to bend the antitrust laws, uh, the FTC just preferred to take a pass on this one. Um, the next case that I want to talk about that I think highlights the same kind of story is a uh, famous Microsoft case uh, in the late 90s where Microsoft was alleged to be um, integrating through, through some kind of technological tying arrangement its browsers uh, with the uh, Windows operating system. And if, you, and if you looked at what they got in trouble for, it wasn't so much what they did inside the firm, but, but rather what they did outside the firm. It was the, it was the restrictions that they put on the original equipment manufacturers that, that raised the ire of, of the antitrust enforcers and, and, and was a clear violation of the antitrust laws. But again, the, 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 the courts were, were loath to get inside of the firm and to start telling it um, what it could and couldn't do inside the four corners of the firm. Uh, there's one more case that I think highlights this, this reluctance to go inside of a firm with antitrust enforcement, um, and that is the FTC's recent investigation of transitions lenses. This one isn't as glamorous, so you might not know about it, but we do, all do know about the transitions lens. It's the one that uh, uh, shades uh, as soon as it's exposed to UV rays. And what the, what the FTC did was they told transitions that it was no longer allowed to enter into exclusive arrangements with lens casters, with one exception, the lens caster that, that it had acquired and had vertically integrated into. So they, they weren't prepared to say that we want to bust up that exclusive arrangement that you have with a company, uh, called, es <laughs> with a company called Essilor. Uh, we can tolerate your exclusivity when it's inside of the firm, but we're not going to go in. Uh, what we are willing to do is to bust up all of your contracts with distributors outside of the firm. Um, and so my, my, my big takeaway from this is that there, there is an important gap, um, and, that, and that gap is that I believe a vertically integrated firm, and in this space it's the vertically integrated platform provider, uh, can achieve a certain kind of uh, immunity um, or, or a, a vertically integrated bubble, if you will, from antitrust I enforcement. Um, so let's, let's now go back and talk about the stuff that um, antitrust can easily take care of, and we'll come back and, and see what kind of regulation, if any, is needed uh, for the gap. Horizontal mergers are, are an obvious one. There, 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 there is no um, deficit or, 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 or default with the antitrust laws here, and, uh, and for that reason, having the FCC engage in, a, in a, what, what I consider to be a purely duplicative re review process um, is just bad policy. Um, uh, and that's exactly what we have here. The, 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 the final paper that I, that I showed you on that uh, suggested reading list uh, shows you the kind of uh, horrible games that go on in D.C. Uh, that are made possible by this duplicative process. You basically have competitors coming in and lobbying on their own behalf with no consideration at all of, the, of consumer welfare, or social interests, but instead just of their, their private interest, and, and actually achieving quite a bit of success in getting the FCC to give away goodies pursuant to a merger review process. The problem with this, you know, you might say, well, who cares? You know, if these guys come in, this is just how DC operates. The problem is that if, you're, uh, if, if you are contemplating a merger that's going to generate a certain amount of synergy or rents for the, for the merging parties, and you know that because of this process, you know, a quarter of it is going to be carved out and, ha and has to be uh, handed to uh, your, your, you know, the rivals with the greatest connections in Washington, you might end up just abandoning a pro-competitive merger. 
and that would be a bad thing. The, the, other, the, the other notion that, uh, and this is an idea, I'm not going to take credit for it, but Steve Salop had this idea that, on the other hand, if you know that you can buy off constituencies through this uh, rent redistribution game that the FCC has set up, it might actually encourage anti-competitive mergers to come forward. Um, so uh, for, for those reasons, I, I'm, I'm perfectly ready to say that the FCC uh, should, should take a back role uh, to the antitrust enforcement agencies when it comes to merger review and instead should have an advisory role. Um, that is to say, they, they should have a seat at the table, but they necessarily uh, shouldn't have a vote uh, at the table. Um, but those are largely horizontal mergers. Let me now talk about, about uh, vertical mergers, because uh, I think we might get into a space um, where the antitrust laws are deficient. Uh, <clears throat> the, the model that I have in mind is when a, when a vertically integrated platform provider um, um, goes up and, and acquires either by contract or, or, or by acquisition some kind of must-have input uh, in the upstream space and then decides to refuse to license it to a downstream uh, distribution rival. Um, there's a paper that I, I just published uh, in the Review of Network Economics with Dr. Kevin Caves, uh, 2013, and we looked to see if, um, if in fact, uh, vertically integrated cable operators were overcharging for regional sports networks when you control for all the other things that would affect uh, the price of the network. And we found, in fact, that, that vertical integration did cause the prices to be higher. And they, the, the, the overcharge increased with the size of the cable operator's downstream footprint um, uh, in the area over which the regional sports network broadcast its games. So why do we, why do we care about this? Well. Uh, from a consumer's perspective, what we care about is that it could raise a rival's cost. So uh, I understand I've got five minutes left. Um, and and uh, why, why do we wor worry there? Well, if, if rivals have higher costs, then they're not going to be able to impose the same degree of discipline in the downstream market, and that might lead to higher cable prices, or it can reduce output. What I mean by this is that if they, if they raise the price of the input to their rivals so high, that a, that a rival distributor might say, fine, I'm, I'm not going to carry it on my basic tier, but I'll instead carry it on some, some tier that uh, has very low penetration. My policy implication here uh, is, is not to ban vertical integration, which is what, a lot, which is what some voices are actually saying, but instead uh, to permit it, but to police it on, on an ex post basis with uh, program access protections. Um, now let me talk quickly about discrimination in the opposite direction. So here, um, a uh, platform provider has vertically integrated into content and decides to make life difficult for rival content providers by not giving it the same kind of distribution or carriage or treatment uh, as, its, as its affiliated upstream network. Um, uh, again, two policy options. Everyone's probably familiar with this book by Tim Wu called The Master Switch in which he's saying the only solution is to ban vertical integration entirely. Um, but, but there are many of us, including Bob Hahn, Bob Light, and Christopher Yu at Penn, who advocate instead to, uh, for a more permissive regulatory approach, which is allowing for vertical integration, uh, but to police discriminatory acts um, on an ex post basis. Um, and this, this tees up the question, well, if you're, if you're with us uh, so far, if you're with us that we should police this thing on an ex post basis, who should be the policeman? Uh, should it be an antitrust court, or should it be uh, the FCC? And Bob and I discuss in the book Need for, Sp Need for Speed why we think antitrust um, is not the best solution. It moves very slowly. As I said before, it's not as concerned uh, with the loss to innovation or reduction to diversity that we as a society might be. Uh, and the market power requirement that I showed you earlier may never be met in many of these circumstances. And of course, the FCC isn't perfect. Um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, potentially more politicized. Uh, but, but even with those warts, we think that the FCC could maintain a role in, in serving as the enforcer um, on, a, on an ex post basis. Uh, if, if I have um, two or three minutes left, uh, I, I, I found it very disheartening during the whole net neutrality debate um, that we basically came up with a new definition of, of discrimination. Um, we went after it in a completely different way, and we weren't even cognizant of the fact that, that the FCC already adjudicates discrimination computes, uh, disputes in the video space through an ex post case by case review. And instead, what the FCC did under Chairman Janikowski was completely close an eye uh, to, to what they were doing in the video space 
and came up with, a, with an entirely different regulatory framework um, for, for, for the Internet space. And um, I guess if I, can, uh, if I could just close quickly on, on the open Internet order. I was having a, a, a policy dispute with a, with a friend over at uh, Free Press. And, uh, and he said, no, 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 Hal, you, you've got it wrong. They really did embrace ex post review. And so, you know, we went into the order. And I want everyone, when they, uh, when, when they get, because uh, a lot of people who are critical of the FCC say they basically, they made had what is called a per se rule. They basically made it a violation to enter into a, a contract for priority delivery. They said it would presumptively violate the non-discrimination provision. But if you go into footnote 229, um, they, they actually uh, claim that, no, 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 instead what they've done is an ex post case by case review. And they say, and I'm paraphrasing, um, we've adopted an approach here that's much more tolerant <laughs> than the flat ban on priority contracts that were proposed in the notice of proposed uh, rulemaking, right? Um, but but uh, again, if you've if you've declared that the conduct is presumptively in violation of the non-discrimination principle, um, and thereby assign the burden of proof to the to the access provider, you've effectively regulated these contracts out of existence. The reason why we haven't seen any such contracts is because uh, any any provider would know going in that that they they would almost be be impossible to justify with any kind of uh, efficiency defense. So if we're going to if we're going to rip this regime apart and I think the courts will and just in closing I think the uh, the FCC would be well served to to look at what it's doing now in the in the video space and that is they should permit these sorts of contracts uh, for priority delivery that have been effectively banned. The presumption should be that they're being done for efficiency reasons. And if any website wants to step forward and claim that it's being discriminated against on the basis of affiliation, um, it should have the burden of demonstrating uh, that, uh, that the, the contract was done for, for anti-competitive reasons. Um, and so I will, I will wrap up uh, with that. I think I've <laughs> gone over my allotted time. And I appreciate you guys having me today. Thanks. Thank you, Al. Um, can I ask what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little panel discussion and in the remaining time, let me tell you how I'm planning to uh, allocate that time. I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists to respond five minutes at the most to what they heard from the other presentations <clears throat> and um, see what uh, came out of that. Then uh, I have some questions for the panelists. I expect some of the panelists have questions for each other as well, but uh, after we get through this initial response, I'll see also if there's any audience questions as well, and we will integrate them accordingly. So let me, let me well, why don't we go in order, but I'll save myself for last. Uh, so go ahead, Jim. What, what, what did you learn? What, did you, what do you want to correct or comment <laughs> on? I don't want to correct anyone, but uh, just some uh, responses and questions that I had. Um, first, with your talk, Larry, I found it very, um, your notion of the disruption, I, I think, fits very well with some of the notions of the general purpose technology that I talked about. And I was thinking about the example that you gave of the Thai cafe. Um, the, disruptive, the disruption there uh, relying on the general purpose technology, which is the 3D printer. And yes, we see the, dis the disruptions appearing in consumer space as new products come and go. But I think, um, or just to link it, back to what's going on with broadband is that that's, that's the foundation or that's the general purpose technology that allows disruption and creativity in this space. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important. Um, you mentioned um, the probable need for diminishing the role of state regulation. And I agree, I think, um, from a standpoint of political economy, I think that's going to be very difficult. And so here's one of the reasons why. Um, state and federal regulators are very concerned about the notion of universal service mm -hmm. and universal access. And by the nature of bureaucracies, historically, I think the regulatory mindset finds it, finds it easier to deal with those questions in the context of, you know, go back 50 years, the monopoly provider with whom they can come up with a special deal. 
of we'll protect you from competition and then you serve everyone. And the, the modern world of the telecom marketplace and the communications marketplace of dynamism, new firms coming in, new technologies, very hard for regulators to deal with. And so there's just this institutional reluctance to adapt. Um, so Rich, for your channeling of Thomas Malthus and the limits of growth, <laughs> um, just, a, just an initial comment. Um, you, have, you took on a very difficult task um, because to no projected growth trend is exogenous, right? Of course, what growth will be depends on what prices exactly. will be, and what prices will be depend on what scarcity in the necessary supply side of the market is. So you did an amazing job of pointing out you know, where the pinch is going to come and where it might be eased. Um, I think we'll only know when we see. And, and I did, you know, your last bullet point on price, prices and the price mechanism, um, I, I think that will be very interesting to see. Because almost by definition, um, the quantity supplied uh, or quantity demanded and actually transacted in the marketplace cannot exceed quantity supplied. And so price will have to give or demand will have to go unsatisfied and how that plays out I think will be very interesting to see. Um, one question, I, I don't know, do you want responses yeah, to questions no, now or should I just the put them out? You put okay. it out but we won't answer. Okay, so one of the questions um, with spectrum usage efficiency, it, just from a technical standpoint, should we expect a Moore's law here or should we expect decreasing return? In other words, are there physical limits that we expect to bump up against there or can we expect that the whiz kids in the lab will continue to find ways to, to do that? Um, will the improvement of 5G over 4G and 7G over 6G be as great as 4G over 3G? Um, so Hal, here, here's my question for you. I, I found your talk very interesting. So will it take an Alfred Kahn type person to really change things at the FCC. So um, for those of you not familiar with that name, you know, we used to have regulated airlines in this country and we used to have an interstate commerce commission that set prices for railroad trail for traffic. Um, Alfred Kahn came in and was from the academic world but very politically savvy, came in and was involved with deregulating those industries. So my question is, you know, is that what it would take and who do you think that person might be to do things at the FCC. Um, the other question I had, so you know, when I was spent a bit of time at the FCC sitting around the table with the other economists there, I'd say, look, you know, what do you guys do that antitrust couldn't do? Right? Just kind of throwing that out there to play devil's advocate. You can guess what they said. Um, public interest. Mm -hmm. right? So the Communications Act of 1934, whatever it is, has this notion of uh, the FCC is there to serve and promote the public interest. And you can drive a truck through that mm -hmm. because the public interest is what Congress or the FCC deems it to be. So for example, you mentioned that the broader mandate of the FCC might help out in perhaps more emphasis on innovation than antitrust <laughs> law itself might have. But for every focus on innovation, you get some kind of weird interpretations you know, like, for example, localism in the media bureau, the idea that small, inefficient newspapers, as long as they're local, is somehow good. Well, well maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's, you know, it, it's, um, or just another example, um, emphasis or set-asides on minority-owned ventures. You know, so, I mean, it can go lots of different directions that might be kind of far. And so my question for you in that respect is, how would you word it or how could we do it so that it was something less than a blanket public interest mandate that could be taken in any direction but yet to keep it um, something larger than antitrust in a way that's focused? Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. That was a good, good very difficult question. So I'm glad I <laughs> got the easy one. Richard, do you have any comments on the other papers? <coughs> uh, sure. Uh, there was kind of a linkage between your paper, Larry, and, uh, and Jim's in this trying to tease out, well, what are the gains that we get from uh, 
broadband technologies, or mobile broadband technologies in particular. And one of the big issues or big determinants of what gains we get and how big they are depends on, well, what these technologies are used for. And these technologies can certainly be used in the general purpose aspect. We use them as being business inputs, that they make businesses more productive and should make workers more productive. Uh, but at the same time, we see huge amounts of usage of these for what I'll call you know, recreational purposes or entertainment purposes, which you know, is a residential activity. It's not a you know, business activity. And the measurements that we have of broadband tend to just lump all of those things together. But when you try to tease out, well, what is the effect on jobs or employment or wages and things like this, one might expect that that would be more acutely related to business use of broadband as opposed to total use or residential use. So I'm wondering, you know, anything you can say more about uh, you know, what the benefits are of these different types of usages and whether that is likely confounding one's ability to figure this, uh, what's going on. Um, Hal, I, again, I really appreciate your, your paper. You certainly throw enough uh, flaming spears uh, around to uh, uh, elicit a lot of uh, reaction. But one issue that kind of comes up uh, about this issue of duplicative jurisdiction over various things, whether it's the anti antitrust division or in the Federal Communications Division or the state PUCs, uh, has to do with even if they have the same legal authority or the, their legal authority is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is overlapping, uh, it often seems that they don't necessarily have the same expertise. Now, when I worked at the antitrust division back a million years ago, uh, we thought we had exquisite expertise on uh, telecommunications matters. In fact, more so than the FCC did, and the whole justification for the, uh, uh, for the uh, AT&T divestiture uh, was that the FCC had been captured by the industry. They didn't know how to regulate it well and that the uh, Department of Justice had more, had, had better expertise about that. But now, you know, perhaps culminating in that DOJ letter uh, that was written, you know, about a month ago uh, suggesting that there should be bid restrictions, uh, it seems to suggest that, in my mind, that expertise about uh, communications industries has, 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 has left the DOJ. And uh, even if you only want one entity to do it, maybe you'd like the entity that has more capable people. And uh, I'm just wondering if you could address your thoughts about, about whether the capability of the individuals is important or just the assignment of legal responsibility. Now, general comments? All right, let's see. <coughs> I, I, I did not uh, think to bring a pen up here with me, so this is all, <laughs> all, all done by memory. But I, I really thought uh, that all three of the speeches were, were excellent. Um, Larry, I, I wanted to, um, uh, I know that in, in writing a book, and that, that pinball example is excellent and should, and it should cause the, the book to fly off the shelves. Um, but I, I wanted to alert you to, to some other uh, neat disruptions, um, which is in, in, the, in the internet properties, uh, something that, that, I, that I've looked at was, uh, um, and you can find this in a, in a Milken Review article that I did recently, but you can also just get this from, from uh, different uh, internet sources. I think Hitwise might be, the, might be the vendor. But if you just look at the most popular website properties over the last decade or, or, or 15 or 20 years, you have massive shifts in popularity within given categories. And, um, and, and that, that, I think, is, fits into your, into your general theme about disrupt, disruptions um, and the notion of how hard it is to, it's, it's so tempting for regulators to see an incumbent and think that they're going to be there forever. And then in a blink of an eye, you know, they're, they're displaced by something that we couldn't have even contemplated. Um, on the, I did want to pick uh, just just one nit, and, and and I think it's 
the, the graph should, should stay, but it but might just want to be explained, is that I think you showed different series of Nintendos coming. And what, what, what a naysayer might, might, uh, might react is, that, well, Nintendo was the provider in each of those technologies, and they could, through the pricing, um, affect the, the movement to the, next, to the next generation. And so the most, comp but you do ultimately give an example of we, I think, coming in at, at the end. Um, but I think that for the first three, it was Nintendo, 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 unless I... Unless They're I all... In, well, that's Nintendo also. Nintendo oh, well, also. then, then, I, then it'd, be, it'd be nice to see some kind of toppling uh, in which... In Clearly, which, do not have young children. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in which different providers were at work, and I'm sure that they, they exist, yeah. but that would get you around the notion that, that, that those kind of evolutions were were orchestrated by the, by the provider. I'm not suggesting they were, but, but I, I fear that that's, that's going to be a reaction. Jim, on the, uh, what, what, what I would, would find interesting, if you could opine on, um, and maybe you just got cut off for time, or I zoned out at the end, um, is what kind of policy implications are there, if any, mm -hmm. at, at getting uh, broadband to, the <clears throat> to minority populations uh, at a faster rate? Um, I, I, I think that's a hard puzzle, and it would be interesting to, to hear your, your views on it. Rich, what, what I would like to hear about, because I'm, I'm excited about um, the prospect of, of wireline displacement by wireless. There are all sorts of forecasts, and I didn't get to it in the, in the end of my slide, but we have some very important voices like Cisco. Uh, there's, a, there's a survey by Lykeman Research uh, that was written up in the Wall Street Journal recently, but the day is coming very soon where people are going to cut their wireline cord and go entirely with wireless. And what I'm, what I'm uh, in addition to spectrum constraints, I also kind of see a, a pricing constraint that I'd like you to talk about, which is how do you envision the, uh, say, video offerings um, appearing in, 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 a, in a wireless platform? Would, would we ever get to a, a day where we could have linear, uh, I hate to use jargon, but kind of where you have a program guide and you can actually pick, pick stations um, uh, on a wireless platform? Uh, or is it going to be more of the uh, Netflix variety where you pick your, your favorite movie and pull it down? And if so, um, are the wireless providers ready to really offer something like that in direct competition um, with, the, with the wireline providers? Okay, great. Well, let me, uh, I'll be much quicker. I mean, I have questions, but I'll keep my questions. Let me just sort of respond uh, very briefly to the other papers, which I've got a great deal of information from both your presentations as well as the, the, the written stuff as well. Um, I think what I, so <laughs> it's very simple. Here's what I heard. I heard um, broadband would have significant impact in a positive way, both generally and specifically for rural and minority populations. Uh, so we need to find ways, you know, to accelerate it. Uh, I heard uh, from Rich that, you know, we need more spectrum, uh, no matter how you slice it, whatever, you know, things we bring to bear from a technological standpoint, uh, we're going to need more spectrum, and that still won't uh, do, the, uh, do the trick. And what I heard from Hal is that neither the FCC nor the Department of Justice nor the Federal Trade Commission is uh, well institutionally suited to help us much in accelerating any of those. And in fact, if anything, they're the things that are holding back uh, uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, the acceleration that we would like to see. So rather than sort of policy levers that would, that we would think, oh well, you know, what what can you know, what can we do as a as a as a society to use house phrase? What can we do as a acting through our government? What can we do to accelerate access to broadband for rural and minority communities? What can we do as a government <coughs> to make more spectrum available or to make better use of the existing spectrum that we've got? And it's it's a misallocation. Uh, and what I got from Hal is, uh, well, don't expect that to come from the government because they're the ones that are slowing things down. And I think that fits. Generally, with you know, with the the, the research that we're doing uh, for the for the book, suggests that yeah, the, essentially, if if you remember the picture I showed of their traditional technology adoption as a bell curve, and then what we're seeing is the the new form of technology adoption being a much more uh, much more dramatic up and down. If you were sort of going to add a third uh, graph to that chart, showing kind of the speed of of regulatory uh, change. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't even measure? It would just be flatlined. Um, and, and then, in fact, I I as as consumers get faster, as markets get faster, as technology introductions get faster, government doesn't get faster at all. 
there aren't any of the same kind. You know, the, the deflation of technology doesn't affect them. The lower cost of uh, innovation, research, and development doesn't affect them. There really is no impact of these changes on the pace of, of government. And so, regardless of whatever the, the best intentions are, uh, it's it's not going to help. Uh, and in fact, uh, you you see more and more unintended negative consequences when we you know, try to intercede, but we do it in a way that's so slow that by the time, you know, you look at some of the antitrust cases that you mentioned how, by the time we actually get to the Microsoft case, we get to the end of it, the market has changed so dramatically that whatever re remedy was going to make sense three years earlier is, you know, irrelevant at best and probably <coughs> negative at worst. And then we spend years and, you know, billions of dollars enforcing a remedy for a problem that changed by the time we got to it. So this is, you know, th these, are, these, are, these are clear. So it's kind of depressing in a sense that we, we we need to find other levers other than policy levers in, in order to solve the, the, the digital divide, in order to fix the spectrum problem. And it ain't going to be antitrust, and it ain't going to be the, the FCC. That's what, so that's what I got. Um, so we got some, already got some good questions to, for each other to answer, and then I have some more. But I think before we start answering questions, why don't we see uh, if there's anything burning uh, out in the room. Are there any, any burning questions anybody has, or would you just like us to answer each other's questions? Yeah, Mike. So, uh, it seems like the, the big news today is that Instagram announced that they're bringing um, video to their platform. Video seems to be the way that uh, mobile broadband usage is, is spiking. So, um, it may be a question across the board for everyone, but um, you know, with applications like Vine and now Instagram um, upping the ante, what does that mean to? Um, to these mobile broadband networks that are already strained, and um, how do regulators respond to an announcement like today's that seems to change the landscape for um, uh, networks nationwide? Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like you first, at least, Rich. Do you want to? First of all, I didn't hear the announcement, so that's already news news to me, and I suspect word travels even more slowly to Washington. Let, let me try to kill two birds with one stone. Your question was kind of similar to uh, one, of, one of Hal's questions for me, and that is, how well can wireless substitute for wireline in the, de in the de delivery of video? That you know, video takes up a lot more bandwidth uh, than uh, you know, just single pictures. And there's been all sorts of thoughts about this that initially the thought was, well, people would get television, on, brought, like broadcast type television on their mobile devices. And there were some various attempts made uh, to do that, one by Qualcomm called Media Flow. And the broadcasters keep saying, well, if we could just uh, get more spectrum, we could offer uh, 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 mobile, mobile television. Uh, however, so far these things have not been really accepted in the market that uh, people want to get, they don't want to accept for maybe the NBA Finals tonight or uh, you know, unique sports events of that type. They don't all want to watch the same thing at the same time, which is how you get the efficiency of broadcast, that you send out one stream and it gets received by uh, many people simultaneously. Uh, for Instagram type things and other video purposes, people just want to send one stream out, and it's going to be particularly received by the, each individual who uh, who, get, who 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 wants to watch that. So it creates a far larger load on the network because you have to have multiple copies of things going through networks. Uh, now. I'd love to say that mobile is going to have the capacity to substitute for wireline, for, for video. Uh, but in a unicast world, it probably isn't going to work. If you look at like Netflix, uh, Netflix high def goes down at about one gigabyte an hour of usage. And yeah, mobile, if you transcode it down to reflect the smaller screen, maybe you're down to uh, uh, you know, a you know, half a gigabyte or a quarter of a gigabyte uh, an hour, but the uh, the capacity projections by Cisco, uh, I'd have to check, but my quick back of the envelope calculation was that that would imply 
each device getting about 10 gigabytes a month in 2022. And uh, you know that's probably not enough given the voracious number of hours that people consume, uh, consume television type services to be able to handle that type of load. So if you're big into watching video, uh, you, you, you may not be able to go mobile only unless you're willing to accept fairly low uh, quality and only, only watch it on small screens. Uh, so, you know, going to, you know, Mike's question that uh, you, you would love to be able to say that mobile is going to be able to handle all these things, but that's the reason why demand keeps going and that, uh, you know, right now I was quoting what the, the throughput rate is for current HD uh, video and now people are already talking about 4K and 8K uh, television systems that will only in double or quadruple or more the, uh, the bit rates that need to be handled by these networks. So. Uh, you're swimming faster, but the current you're swimming against is getting stronger all the time. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on that, or we'll go, because that was pretty comprehensive and scary. Um, uh, any other audience questions? I'm yeah. Not, I'm not an expert in this field, but in Europe, the access to mobile and the, the cost plans are far more competitive than here, and the coverage is far greater. Um, do you ever compare the carriers there? What, I'm just curious to know, like, you can always get. Yeah, well. So let me, sorry, let me repeat, I meant to do the last time, and I apologize. Let me repeat the question, because you don't have a microphone. But the question is, essentially, how does, how does broadband in the US compare to broadband in, in Europe? And, and is it better, is it worse? What's, what's the, and Rich, you're involved with this, so you, you could probably take well, that let, as well. Well, let me talk about mobile broadband. And unfortunately, uh, well, Unfortunately for Europe and fortunately for the U.S., I'd have to say that those reports are now several years stale. Uh, that over the course of the last three or four years, U.S. networks have become far more capable and the majority of people in the world who are using LTE live in the U.S. right now. Uh, when you look at the most recent reports on average data throughput rates, and uh, usage, you see the U.S. distinctly above 50 to uh, 100 percent uh, greater than Europe nowadays. Now, as to the pricing, uh, it's often hard to compare pricing because in the U.S. we tend to have mostly what we call postpaid subscriptions where you buy a service and pay for it at the end of the month and that uh, you often get multiple, uh, multiple services on that, uh, on that subscription. And so therefore, people in the US typically only have one subscription per person. Whereas in the way these things are counted, in Europe, people often buy, uh, prepaid is far more common and people maintain multiple uh, prepaid SIM cards so that you see that they look like they've got about 150 subscriptions for every 100 people. So even if the price of their subscription is, let's say, two-thirds the price of a subscription in the U.S., the U.S. They, the people in Europe have one and a half times <laughs> of those subscriptions uh, so that you can't make a direct comparison between what the per subscription price is without normalizing for how many subscriptions per person you have and the usage. And, uh, you know, the U.S. over the last couple of years has really pulled ahead. And I have to say that I was in Paris last week uh, attending some OECD meetings and my phone, I was lucky when half the time it showed 3G and the other half the time it wasn't showing 4G, you know, it was showing edge uh, 2G. That, uh, you know, we real the U.S. has just kind of done a leapfrog over the last two or three years. What are we doing against South Korea and Japan? I know that they have pretty robust networks. They've been very video heavy for the last couple of years. Are we in the ballpark with them? Are we way ahead of them? So the and I'll just repeat it. So the question was about how do we compare to South Korea and Japan in mobile? Uh, 
Okay, in, in mobile, uh, I'm less familiar. I, I, don't, I don't want to quote sp specific statistics there because I'm less familiar. Uh, Japan was the first country really to go to uh, mobile broadband services and developed a whole very big infrastructure. They have a lot used, but their prices tend to be fairly high. Uh, Korea is a bit different. Uh, Korea has more economical prices, but I would say that we are very competitive with these we, with these countries right now. Yeah, sure. I just weigh in. Can I go back to your mobile and then I'll get to, get to your broadband? And it looks like you have another question too. I'd commend you to read uh, a new report that just came out by by a trade association called GSM. It's a consortium of something like 800 mobile operators worldwide, and they did a comparison of wireless offerings in Europe uh, versus uh, those in the in the U.S. And I'm just going to give you some very high level uh, findings. But to, to echo what, what Rich said, the, there has been much more investment in next generation data, mobile data networks in the U.S. than there has been in Europe. And as a result, we have much more uh, uh, you know, 3G and 4G deployment. We have uh, more usage of those technologies. Uh, a given customer here will, will download more content onto their mobile phone than a customer uh, in, in Europe. And uh, the authors were trying to look for reasons why Europe is having a hard time um, getting their carriers to, to make these sorts of commitments, investment commitments, and to get to the fourth generation. And, and, I, and I recall one of the top line problems was that Europe is, it was cut um, into so many little slices and given the large economies of scale uh, that, are, that are potentially realized through these networks. Um, that, that U.S. carriers are getting to exploit economies in a way that, uh, that the, um, the European counterparts do not. Um, in response to your question, I would, I would commend a study by Akamai, which comes about, out about once a year. And uh, it does, I think it's A-K-A, M-A-I. Um, they, they do speed comparisons by, by country. It's very interesting. And uh, just going by memory, the, the latest uh, speed comparison had the U.S. at about eighth behind the countries that, that you named. But with this one important caveat, that uh, what they're doing uh, when they give uh, speed is the average speed across the nation, right? And so the U.S. is interesting in that we have a very wide spread around the averages. The good news is that where, where the concentration of, 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 of people are living, we have very, very high speed. So what, what Akamai study does is it breaks out speeds by state. And if you look along the eastern seaboard in California, any of those states, if they were their own country, would, would jump up the rankings and go into like third and fourth, okay, as, one, as, as among the highest in the world. But because our super high speeds, you know, in the eastern corridor in California get, get averaged in with the slower speeds in the, in the plains and the flyover places, <laughs> I'm not running for office or FY <laughs> office anytime soon, um, you know, you, you, it causes us to fall down, down the rankings. Let me let me give. Uh, uh, I want to. He had one more question, though. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. I'm just curious. Is there any country whose model we should be trying to follow? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there anyone out there that we should be looking to to see what they've done? I know Japan put early investment into infrastructure, uh, but is are they running out of spectrum? Are they running out of brand bandwidth? Uh, is there a model we should be following from somewhere else? No. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, just this, this industry is so dynamic, and each country tends to have, often tends to have very different usage patterns. That, uh, uh, you know, Japan is a country where huge amounts of usage take place while people are commuting on trains and things like this. That uh, uh, there's just so much difference between how people use the service in one country versus how they use it in other countries that. You know the different countries search out what are the uh, what are the mechanisms that work best to meet the demands that their populations face. So, I, do, I don't know that there really is a you know clear this is the shining tower on the hill that everybody needs to needs to fall behind. And all I know is if there is such a tower like that, it's unlike it's likely to be on a different hill in another three years. So, can I? Yeah, go ahead. So the, the policy question that gets teed up is that there are countries like Australia uh, that, that have, they, that have um, 
decided that the government needs to own the, the network and make the investments. But that, that presumes that there's some kind of market failing, right? That for some reason we cannot count on, on, on private interest to, to give us the speeds that we need as a society. And, and um, what I have a hard time uh, digesting that, uh, the reason why I have a hard time digesting that is that it seems to me that if there is a demand for these sorts of applications, um, then there should be incentives for private network owners to, to upgrade their systems. So, you know, for example, I, there's, a, there's a writer in the Washington Post named Cecilia King who, 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 is, who loves to boast about the new applications that are made possible by, by Google's one gigabyte up and down. And, um, and the application that she always uses is a, is a firm sending out medical images that, that are in very high resolution and would choke up unless they had the one gigabyte. And that's nice. Um, and vital, in fact. But the question is, is there, is there enough of that uh, to induce uh, a network operator to expand its capabilities to one gigabits in, in the upstream direction? Um, so that, that's, that's how that, that, that the question that you pose gets teed up in a, in a policy sense. Uh, yeah, go ahead, and I'll bring you back in. One thing that both of these questions raised is, on the cost side, these places are very different than the US. OK, so in Korea, South Korea, um, huge population density, it, that, that's a cheap area to serve, other things equal. And I think it's really a testament to what's gone in the US broadband industry that it did grow as quickly as it did, um, both mobile and fixed. I mean, this is a big place, right? From sea to shining sea, there's lots of empty, relatively low density land in the middle. And so, yeah, there will be a South Korea or a Denmark or, you know, some, there, there will always be countries on, the, on whatever international list you look at that might look higher than the U.S., but it's, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Jim, let me, so l let me keep you here and, and ask you because you, in addition to the questions the other panelists, so my question for you is, and you can pick whichever one you want to answer, what order you want to do them in, but Cherry pick. Um, <laughs> given, as you say, the, the, the very likely benefits to accelerating deployment of broadband in rural areas and into minority communities, one thing you didn't mention is, well, what policy leverage do you think we have that could help that, if any? I mean, I yeah. you know, sort of prejudiced my comments earlier by saying I, I didn't think, well, at least so far, the, maybe you think differently, that the ways in which we have used policy and incentives and, and you know, subsidies and so on uh, hasn't seemed to have worked, but maybe that's wrong. Maybe it, ha it has worked and we just need to do more. Or maybe we've done the right amount and the market will take care of the rest. But what, what, what is your sense of the, the, the balance here of uh, policy and, and <laughs> Well, that, that's the questions. question. Um, just two kind of high-level responses. I, I think one of the policy implications, and this is a very general one that just comes out of this field and stuff that I've looked at is to the extent that you can, the government should not explicitly get in the mode of trying to pick te technological winners. And, and so the application here, I think, is if it's universal service or whatever the policy is, don't disadvantage mobile over fixed. Or, you know, don't. Mm -hmm. it, so, you know, when I was at the FCC, there was. It, less talk now, but at the time, this sense that you know, mobile was a second-hand experience or some you know, lower quality. I'd say it's different. I mean, there's no question that mobile broadband is different than fixed broadband. It's, it's better at some things. It might be worse at other things. Um, I think it gets very tricky for the government to try to you know, pick particulars and say, this is what it means to be the fully connected digital citizen. It means that you have to have a you know, certain type of technology or equipment in the home. Uh, the other thing I'd say, and I mean, here I might depart from some of the other folks on the panel, but I mean, this, the broader question here for policy is how much do we want to go down the road of um, specific egalitarianism? Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, you know, you can spend a dollar on broadband, a policy dollar. You could spend it on health care. You could spend it on general income assistance. Um, and, and so the economist in me is a little uncomfortable with saying we need to s target a lot of money to this you know, really narrow slice of the entire American economy. I mean, yes, it's important. Um, 
but that just, I mean, the, so the broader, you know, you spend a dollar on this, well, what didn't you spend mm -hmm. it on? I mean, that's the role of the pessimistic economist, is to point out the opportunity Although costs. you, your, and I thought your point was well taken, that, that one of the things about a general purpose technology, as you described this, is that it generates consumer surplus, which, as you also know, economists don't do a very good job of measuring or factoring it's in. It's hard to measure, yeah. So, in fact, it's, it's, it's a dollar that we don't actually know how much benefit we're going to get back from because we don't measure it very well, but but you at least have a suspicion that it's better spent there than in some other uh, areas. Yeah, Is that I mean, true or am I, I don't well, want to put words in your mouth. No, no, I th I think so. But uh, the other thing that I would say in the policy realm is, you know, for all the concern about digital inclusion and so forth, just I mean, we've seen several of these trend charts chart charts today. And yeah, it might look a little slower in the U.S. than elsewhere with broadband take up, but th there's no technology in the history of the world mm -hmm. that has grown at the rate that this has. Mm. And I actually see it as a great success story for what industry has largely been able to do on its own. And I, I just, you know, yes, policy can, you know, have you know some second order effects on what's going on, but this is a technology that people have, by and large, found incredibly useful and have adopted at an incredible rate. Mm -hmm. Hal, I wonder if you could answer Jim's question, which was, uh, could we actually come up with a better definition or any definition for the public interest that would give the FCC a meaningful role but not a blank check as they've, uh, as they've had, or that at least as they've exercised it, uh, at least tried to, no, uh, tried to exercise it in, in many cases, or do you think the public interest is a, is a hopeless cause? So I think the problem is that if you start with public interest, it'll take you anywhere, mm -hmm. including important things like localism. Um, uh, if, you, if you instead say, um, tee up the question the way that I try to tee it up, which is what's, what's left over after antitrust, at least that's a limiting principle. It, do, it doesn't take you down to maybe the ultimate set, but just by, just by overlaying that one restriction, you would wipe out a lot of the functions. I think that the FCC was is 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 uh, messing with right yeah. now. Yeah. What's your view? You didn't. Uh, I don't think you said much about the in the sort of design of the voluntary incentive auctions. But does your view of the FCC's pluses and minuses, or its you know, its, its expertise or lack of expertise, how does that suggest to you questions about the design of the incentive auctions? Well, are you ha or, uh, let me put it another way. Are you happy with the progress so far? And if not, what's wrong? No, the, well, the, the, the burning policy question to date is whether or not to exclude uh, AT&T and Verizon from, the, from competition or to severely limit them. And I think that um, uh, the way that we've, we've gotten off on the wrong path is by setting up the, the problem incorrectly. Um, you know, the, the FCC is asked by Congress each year to write a wireless competition report. And that presumes that, that there is such thing as a wireless-only market and that we should be uh, slicing up the spectrum pie in such a way as to maximize competition in that narrowly defined market. But if you were to step back and, and recognize the oncoming competition between wireless and wireline, um, you might come to a very different answer as to what the optimal slicing of the spectrum should be. And it, uh, it might be that uh, five nationwide providers, four or five nationwide providers is too many and that we'd prefer to have uh, beefier uh, yet fewer, yet beefier providers getting into the ring and messing it up uh, with uh, with, a, with an incumbent cable operator. Yeah, I would have to say that actually the uh, this discussion about whether there should be restrictions on certain parties in bidding in the auction has been sucking a lot of oxygen out of the uh, the room in the last couple of weeks or months. But it, it actually is maybe one of the simpler issues that the FCC really has to tackle with. Mm. The really tough ones are how the, do they design a band plan that uses the spectrum efficiently, and how do they design what's called a repacking mechanism to uh, push the uh, TV stations down into a more compact band of spectrum if some of them are willing to give up their spectrum because you can't just have a Swiss cheese of, uh, of available bands around the country. You want to make them all contiguous in, in, the, in the upper part of the zone. Uh, so how do they do that, and how do they make the uh, the uh, the wire the blocks the band blocks that they do sell as uh, interchangeable and equally valuable as possible? That those are probably their three biggest challenges that the that the the issues surrounding uh, uh, 
uh, surrounding whether there should be bid restrictions that are, are relatively cut and dried and mm -hmm. you know, have been plowed before in, the, in, 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 in other contexts. And, and as long as we're on that, Rich, you, you mentioned this letter from the, the Department of Justice. And one of the things that I want to ask you to comment on is uh, that letter sort of suggested that, in fact, there are significant differences. You, so your presentation assumed that all spectrum essentially was equal, that 500 megahertz is 500 megahertz. And when we get it, we get it. If we don't, we don't. Um, the DOJ suggested otherwise, that, in fact, some ranges are worth more than other ranges, and, um, and in particularly in the context of, of, uh, of rural areas, I, I guess, can you, is, has technology now, or gotten to the point, or soon getting to the point where effectively the pluses and minuses of different bands are, are being reduced or eliminated? Are there still significant differences? And if so, what does that say about the auctions? What does that say about rural uh, acceleration? Well, I would say the differences are becoming less critical. The old, old story was is that the lower frequency bands were better because the signal could propagate further at a given power level so that you could cover a given amount of square miles with fewer number of towers. But that was most important when deployment was in order to make increase your coverage area and make coverage universal. Uh, we're now in the situation where coverage is pretty much universal, and it's a matter of deepening the throughput capacity within each area. And for that, having a signal propagate widely becomes far less valuable, and indeed possibly is of negative value in dense urban areas where you, uh, you're better off getting uh, 20 megahertz of higher frequency spectrum because you can kind of keep it in the corral, keep it in, the, in a particular zone so that you can reuse it two blocks over than if you had low frequency spectrum where it would tend to bleed into one another and, inter and, and interfere. So uh, the, to the extent that there is any type of superior value to lower frequency spectrum, it's strictly in the very rural areas. but these are areas where there isn't so much of a scarcity mm. of spectrum given that there's not as much demand there. And further, what we see is that we've seen the prices at which low frequency spectrum is sold for be substantially higher than the prices for which higher frequency spectrum has been sold for. And indeed, I kind of did in the, the, in the UK, they just recently auctioned off some 800 megahertz spectrum and some 2.6 gigahertz spectrum. And I tried to calculate the difference in price per megahertz that they uh, were getting in the auction, assuming that, let's say, you needed, I think it was like two and a half or three times as many cell towers to deploy the 2.6 gigahertz spectrum and calculate the cost of that. And I found that the, cost, the, the price that you were paying, the discount that you were getting for buying the 2.6 gigahertz spectrum roughly mm. paid for your extra infrastructure cost of uh, deploying the more cell towers. So, you know, the, the market works. That uh, there's nothing that, there's, there's no unique bargains for, <laughs> for anything. That the, the price, prices adjust to... Uh, kind of equalize the value of all, of all spectrum. Yeah, Hal, do you want to yeah. add on? Let me just say that there's another way to, to uh, test empirically this, this notion that the, the, that the low frequency spectrum held by T-Mobile and Sprint are somehow impairing their ability to compete effectively. I think, I, I think that if we just state it in, in, in such stark terms, the impairment test, is there evidence of impairment, right? Um, it really tees up the question correctly. And, and I would point out, you know, if, if AT&T and Verizon were running away with the show, what would we see? We, we would see concentration growing over time. And when I looked back at the concentration data that the FCC puts out, the concentration has held steady since about 2007, 2008. And moreover, last year, well, 2012, um, Sprint and, and T-Mobile were boasting in their announcements to, to shareholders and to the press about how well they were doing in terms of growing their, their subscribers. <laughs> so I think that if you, if you want to make an impairment story, you need evidence of impairment. Beyond just kind of the theoretical possibilities, you actually would want to show evidence of impairment. And I'm not, I'm not aware of what that, what that evidence is. Well, I, if they thought they were impaired by not having lower frequency spectrum, they might have filed uh, 
for, short for, long, they might have actually bid in the 700 megahertz auction. They both sat out that auction completely. They didn't even file a bid. They didn't f even f put in a filing to, to make a bid. Uh, so it's kind of a pretty big turnaround in the last couple of years, and one assumes that you know, perhaps they're hoping that uh, uh, they, they would like this spectrum, especially if they can get it at a discount from what otherwise its market price might go for if they're the only people who are effectively bidding on it. I, I, think, on, I think the analogy um, to agriculture is very useful here because land for farming purposes is of different qualities. You know, so in, in the wireless world, you hear about beachfront spectrum and you know, the, the backwater parts of the band plants. But to the extent that that's capitalized in the prices of the initial licenses, and therefore the opportunity costs of retaining and using that license yourself instead of transferring it or selling it to the extent that you can. You know, if, if, if you're the farmer who has the less productive land, well, that also means your costs are lower. And, and that's how you're able to compete in agriculture even if you don't have the absolute best land. And yeah, I mean, the market works, I, I think. It used to drive me crazy this talk about beachfront spectrum as if um, you know, that wasn't somehow reflected in prices that would equilibrate. I mean, in a, in a completely frictionless market, not that it is one, but you would expect that, that those differences would be completely taken care of by the capitalization, and differences in costs and so forth. So, so we've, we've sort of run to the end of our time, but I was asked to give some sort of summary closing remarks, uh, which is very difficult given the, the breadth of the conversation we've had today. But I think uh, as I think about it, you know, sort of one of the purposes of this event was to try and uh, introduce, and the reason we have it here in Silicon Valley is this is obviously the place where all this technology is invented, or much of this technology is invented that's driving, and this is a good thing, it's driving the demand for broadband and wired and, and uh, wireless uh, uh, capacity. Uh, and I think, you know, our goal was, if nothing else, to, to deliver the message that there are significant policy issues involved with that continued expansion. And as we all are in complete agreement that we would like to see it not only continue, but to accelerate in, in communities or in, in applications or in different contexts, um, it's important, I think, for the people who develop the technologies to understand uh, what these issues are, what the sort of policy trade-offs are, and, and you know, kind of what some of the debate that goes on in Washington, which you know, we in Silicon Valley tend to ignore it as much as we can. That's a good thing. But uh, in this capacity, we probably need to pay more attention to it. So I thank you all for your attention and, uh, and for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.